Welcome to the new MMA podcast, partnered with Concussion Pro One, the world's first dedicated concussion supplement. I'm your host, as always, Newsome, with your co-host John, and with the batteries recharged, we're back once again to break down the final UFC fight card of 2018, with UFC 232 going down on Saturday night in Las Vegas. John, how are you doing tonight, bro? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. It seems like uh, forever since I was last on here talking to you about some fights and. Uh, it seems like, although it's only been a couple of week break, it seems like a long time since I've watched some fights as well. So uh, really looking forward to this card. Absolutely, man. And these end of year cards from the UFC are always absolutely stacked. And UFC 232 is no different as we have the controversially debated greatest of all time and returning John Bones Jones. I'm really excited to get into that fight. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, if it's anything like the uh, the initial encounter between the two, we we're, uh, we're going to be in for a spectacle. For sure. First of all, I just want to mention the premium bets from Newsom MMA. We have two amazing offers right now for new members. We have a custom membership package and a big saver offer to the silver membership package too. Right now is a great time to jump on board as my form is on point. There's a five fight card winning streak for over 16 units of profit with a 74% return on investment too. To find out more information on these offers, you can contact me on any of my social channels or you can email adam at newsommma.co.uk. And just before we start, I just want to apologise for the UFC Milwaukee podcast being cut short around 12 hours after it was uploaded to YouTube. After analysing the error, it was 100% cut short by YouTube, which apparently is a known glitch. So hopefully this doesn't happen again. So the last UFC event of 2018, let's break down UFC 232 from bottom to top. And in the first fight of the night, we've got the rescheduled Brian Keller versus Montel Jackson now. These two were supposed to uh, throw down on UFC 230. Unfortunately, after the weigh-ins, Brian Kelleher pulled out due to food poisoning, we believe. John, last time you picked Brian Keller, is it still Brian Keller, or have you changed your pick? I, uh, I'm sticking with my pick. I'm going with uh, Brian Kelleher again. Um, I'm, I'm glad they've rebooked this this fight because it's. Uh, it, I think it'll be an exciting, uh, exciting fight and a great uh, fight to open up the card. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to be sticking with my pick on this one. I'm going with uh, going with Brian Kelleher, um, Montel Jackson. Um, he looks impressive. He, he, he's definitely um, he's definitely going to go places in the UFC. But this moment in time, I think Kelleher is um, he, he's more experienced. He's a dangerous guy. Um, as I was saying last time on the UFC 230 podcast, he's he's dangerous when they keep it standing, as we saw against Damien Stasiak uh, with getting that uh, getting that finish. Uh, he's dangerous with um, when it goes to the ground. He's dangerous when people shoot him for a takedown. He's got a couple of guillotines, uh, quite a few. Uh, sorry, quite a few guillotines on his uh, on his record. And and yeah, I, I just like the way he keeps active, keeps pushing the pace. Um, it will it, work tirelessly. Um, he, he, he doesn't sit sit back and um, and, and rest. He, he he's always coming forward. And and yeah, I just think he'll um, he'll just about have enough to uh, to edge out Montel Jackson in a decision in this one. Yeah, I disagree once again. Uh, I picked Montel <laughs> Jackson last time and I'm, I'm sticking with uh, Jackson again this time. I just think he's he's going to cause a whole host of problems for Brian Keller in this fight. He's got, I think, a four-inch four, four inch, uh, height advantage. He's got an 11-inch reach advantage. Um, so the dude's going to be absolutely huge compared to Kelleher. And the thing is with Montel Jackson, he can keep range as well. So his movement's really good. He'll just move out of range when, when strikes are coming in, you know, from uh, from an offensive point of view, he'll just move out of range or he'll angle off nicely. He's not an all-in or all-out type of fighter. He, he will be in and out and just gauging what's going on now. I don't think you can put too much stock into his last fight in the UFC against Ricky Simone. Ricky Simone would do that to most of the fighters in, in the UFC or most of the fighters anywhere that, that he fights. And yeah. he has done that to most of the fighters that he's fought <laughs> in regards to just being totally relentless, getting in there, um, looking for the takedown and, and not a lot else. But he was hurt in that fight, Ricky Simone, and it was the straight left, I believe, coming from Montel Jackson. And I think those are going to be real weapons in this fight because uh, the straight punches, the nice uh, one-twos or the nice twos, like I say, the nice uh, straight left, straight down the middle, those types of uh, strikes for a guy that's going to have an 11-inch reach advantage is going to be huge. Brian Keller does angle nicely as, as he's moving in. You know, he, he doesn't come straight at his opponents. So... For example, if Montel Jackson was throwing hooks or anything coming from angles, um, it might be a little bit more difficult to to hit Brian Kelleher. But like I said, these these sniper shots straight down the middle are, p- are going to be perfect for for hitting somebody that that is on the move like uh, like Brian Kelleher will be. I, I don't think Kelleher is a bad fighter. 
he's but he is a dog fighter so he's a fighter that likes a scrappy tough fight yeah. just likes to throw down in the pocket but the thing is for that type of fighter you need a dog fight for that dog fighter to flourish and montel jackson i just don't think will give him that type of fight he won't stand there in the pocket and just trade relentlessly and and hope for the best he's just not that type of guy um I think, like I say, stylistically, this this fight for Keller, it, it's not great for him. He is going to be chasing the fight. He is going to be constantly trying to get on the inside of Montel Jackson. He has to get on the inside of Montel Jackson. And then once yeah. those kicks from Jackson, remember this is a southpaw versus orthodox as well. So the kicks from Montel Jackson is going to be hitting the open body. Um, he's got the legs. He's got, the, like I've said, the, the body and he's got the head that he can mix it up with as well. Um, he will be throwing them moving backwards as Keller is moving forward. So, like I say, I, I just feel that Keller is going to have to overwork in this fight. He's going to have to push harder than what he would uh, he would push normally. Like I say, against for example, against John Lineker, they were both a similar height, a similar reach. So it wasn't so much getting inside. You know, it was more of when they met in the middle, they could just collide. But it, it's a it's a completely different fight. This I think Montel Jackson's ceiling is ridiculous. He comes from a wrestling background as well, so. If Kelleher does engage in, in the wrestling, I do believe uh, Montel Jackson will be able to stuff takedowns. I know he got taken down a lot by Ricky Simone, but he also defended a lot of takedowns as well. A lot that he gets his under uh, his underhooks really well. Um, you know, as the commentary team said about 60 times, he's got bigger hands than Francis Ngannou. He's got the strength as well from, from the hands. He, he, he was on the bottom. He had his back taken, flattened out, and he just stood up from it against Ricky Simone. <laughs> that tells you everything you need to know about the power and the strength that uh, Montel Jackson brings for this weight. I think Keller, like I say, I, I think he's going to have his hands full. I think he's in for a tough fight. Um, you don't know how much damage he, that last fight with uh, with John Lineker uh, is, is taken on his durability and on his chin. So we don't know what sort of effect that's going to have. I can't, well, you can't imagine it to have got any better anyway after that sort of fight. So <laughs> like I say, I think Montel Jackson's going to go places. I think uh, the UFC have rebooked this fight so quickly for a reason. I think uh, they're fully aware that um, this is a good fight for Montel Jackson, not just stylistically, but if they are seeing Jackson where I think they're seeing him and where I'm personally seeing him in regards to having such a high ceiling, a win over someone like Brian Keller is going to look great on his record as well. So I've got Montel Jackson winning. I think the UFC have, like I've just mentioned, have rebooked this fight for a reason so quickly as well. And I do think Jackson's going to get the finish. I can see one of those straight uh, straight shots, straight left hand, straight down the middle, um, dropping Brian Keller and Montel Jackson jumping all over it. So I've got Montel Jackson to win via TKO. Now in the next fight of the night, we've got another great fight. We've got Curtis Melenda coming in against CR Bahadazada. So John, who have you got in this one? Yeah, this is a this is a really interesting fight. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Curtis Melenda uh, from what I've seen of him so far. I think uh, he's another guy who can uh, who can definitely go places in the in the welterweight division and. Um, and and we've seen so far he's uh, with the two fights in the UFC against Thiago Alves and uh, and Max Griffin we we saw that um, he can finish he's got the ability to finish uh, with that lovely knee against Thiago Alves um, Alves although obviously he's coming into the uh, the twilight of his career he's he's still tough to finish we um, we saw that in his last fight um, and then Max Griffin Max Griffin's another tough guy another guy who's uh, who's who's hard to put away and that was a a hard fought decision victory. Um, He's going up against uh, Bahar Zazada. Uh, we don't see much of this guy. I mean, I kind of forget that he's around. He, he, he seems to pop up uh, once a year, but uh, we, we're lucky enough to have had him uh, had him twice this year. Um, that last fight with uh, with Chagas was a, was quite an interesting fight because I mean he he took Chagas down in the first round, but then he um, he there was a little scramble and he, he he had his back taken and he was defending the rear naked choke for for about half the round and. Um, and then he ended up winning with that, uh, with just that kind of that jab body kick that that, uh, that caught him right in the liver and uh, and just sent him buckling. And um, as we've seen many times before, once you get hit in the liver and uh, it takes that takes your breath away, that the, there's no coming back from it. But um, I'm going with uh, Melinda in this one. I I, I really like the guy. He's, um, he looks calm and composed in there. He he doesn't rush anything. I think he's got about a a five or six reach uh, inch reach advantage, which will 
help in this fight. He he does like to throw a lot of kicks, um, push kicks and things like that. So we'll have to be careful of uh, of the takedown because that's how uh, Chagas got taken down in in his fight with uh, Bahada Zada. He, he, he caught the kick and and took it down from there. So he'll, he'll have to be uh, be careful of that. But I think he can work from range, um, far out that jab, far out those front kicks, uh, strong leg kicks. Um, he mixes up that high kick well as well. Um, he's dangerous when they get in the clinch. Um, I just think as, as long as he can keep his range and, and not let uh, Bahada Zada get in, um, get in too close and, and be able to get that take down or, or, or throw one of those wild overhands because he, he does tend to just throw a single strike or, or, or maybe he'll throw out the jab but then a big overhand or a, a big hook and, and we did see that a lot in his last fight. He was just winging one punch uh, at a time and, and, and I think Melinda will be wise to that and I think he'll be able to keep the distance and, and avoid those shots and, and just do damage um, and, and, and just tally up the shots and, and again I think this is going to go to a decision and I think it's going to be uh, Curtis Millender who gets his, uh, his hand raised Yeah I, I agree with you I, I think um, I think Curtis Millender is going to win as well the dude's riding an 8 fight win streak right now and, yeah. um, I like the guy I love his style, I love what he did to Thiago Alves on his debut, you know not many people well, not many fighters, should I say, will end up getting into a, a debut like the uh, into the UFC, like a fight against someone that, with the stature of Thiago Alves, and not only go out and beat them, but absolutely demolish them. You know, yeah. it, it it was a it was a demolition job from from Curtis Melinda. but you know, from that, really liked him. He jumped in with Max Griffin. I bet him that night as well. I cashed that night, but the fight was really close, and yeah, this was, is where yeah. I've got my concerns in in this fight because. After watching the fight with, uh, with Max Griffin, I I saw some some holes in Melendez's game, and this is like I say th- these are the what I'll lead into are the sort of reasons that that I'm a bit, um, not on the edge, but just a bit unsure of of how this fight is exactly going to go down. So we know what CR Bahadazada is at this point. You know, he's is an explosive dude. He packs power in his punches. He's got good explosive reactive takedowns training out of Jackson Wink as well. So you've, you've got to think that regardless of uh, of his age being 34, that he is still, you know, we might not say improving drastically each fight. He could be improving. We don't know. We'll see in this fight. But yeah. he's he's not going to be, I don't think he's, he's hit any sort of decline yet. Now, the problems I have in this fight is, first of all, I've just mentioned that um, Siaba Hadazad has got power in his hands. You mentioned that he throws the one-shot bombs, which is true. Now, Curtis Melendez got this tall man defence that we talk about. So when when these fighters with tall man defence are, are getting shots thrown at them, they tend to back off in a straight line and just keep the chin in the air. And it's almost like they arc the back to try and dodge the punch rather than put their hands up and block it or angle off a, a certain way to try and evade the power of it so for example if it's the right shot coming in angling off to their right you know to sort of re- relieve that power but Curtis Melender doesn't do that another fighter that's um that's prone to this as well just as an example is Alexander Volkov and we saw that unfortunately yeah. in, the, in the fight where Derek, Derek Lewis knocked him out he has that tall man defense and I worry in this fight for Melender that when Bahada Zad is throwing these winging overhand bombs, if he's just stepping back in a straight line and sort of putting his chin in the air and arcing his back to try and get out the way of these punches, I'm telling you, if one of those lands, it gives you a greater chance of knocking your opponent out. And I could genuinely, I could genuinely see that happening. Um, the second issue that I've got with Melender is Max Griffin took him down. Now this is a striker that well Max Griffin is a striker and it's a he's a fighter that isn't top 15 um he's not at that sort of level he's wrestling he's never really been known for uh his top side grappling he's never really been known for yet he came in against Curtis Melender and he hit him with an explosive double leg takedown now you could argue the fact from Melender's side that um, he was just shocked that that happened. He didn't anticipate yeah. it happening because, like I say, I bet Melin- Melinda. I watched all the tape on both guys. I was shocked that it happened. So you could write that. You could write that off and just say, look, it happened. It was. Uh, it was a shock, and it is what it is. But then 
that takedown happened somewhere around the first half of that first round. Now, by the time that final bell rang of that first round, Melinda was still in the same position on bottom. He couldn't get back to his feet. He didn't really show any signs of attacking off the back. You know, he's not that type of fighter. He's not a submission guy that's going to be yeah. throwing up arm bars and triangles from guard. Um, but he, he showed no urgency to get back up to his feet. And I, I don't believe that... It wasn't because he didn't want to get back up to his feet. I just believe that he was just struggling because he didn't, he, he wasn't aware of the correct techniques in those positions to to get himself back up there. Because, like I say, Max Griffin, he, he's not he's not this world class grappler that that's gonna that holds all his opponents down. You know, I do believe if Melinda had the right techniques and the the right abilities to get back up to his feet he, he should have been doing it against max griffin and like i say when somebody gets taken down and they're in the same position two minutes later than what they were two minutes before it's a worry um on the feet though i do think melinda's more skilled i think he's got more weapons in his his arsenal he fights well moving backwards he fights well moving forwards which is always a great advantage in in mixed martial arts in in today's mixed martial arts so he does have that over Bahad Azada and he could wear him down with kicks he could tire him I do think Melendez definitely got the better gas tank here the first seven and a half minutes in this fight is going to be very sketchy because those first seven and a half minutes Bahad Azada is going to be extremely live he's going to be active he will be pursuing um, either a takedown or the overhand bomb I would assume that he's watched tape on Melender and watched that Max Griffin fight and saw that that's a great area of the fight to exploit and yeah. uh, holes to expose of Melinda. So I do think he's going to have the game plan of being explosive, getting Melinda down, uh, maybe winning the uh, the first two rounds and then seeing where it goes. You're probably able to hold off until the end of the fight at that point. But I do think that if Melinda, I do think Melinda will be, uh, will be a lot more wary of that in this fight. I think he could potentially be a bit hesitant in how hard he throws his kicks specifically, but I think the volume will be there for him. I think the longer this fight goes on, the longer Bahar Azada hasn't got him down or hasn't made him work or hasn't knocked him out, I think it'll get harder for him. I think it could be one of those situations where uh, Bahar Azada wins round one, Melinda comes back in round two and then ultimately wins round three. I also agree with you. I think it's going to go to the scorecards and I think it'll be Curtis Melinda getting his arm raised. So I've got Curtis Melinda winning via decision. Now, in the next fight of the night, we've got Uriah Hall versus Bevan Lewis. Who have you got in this one, John? Yeah, this is uh, this is a really tough one to uh, t- to pick. I mean, um, Bevan Lewis is coming in and making his uh, his UFC debut and it's um, it's... By no means uh, an easy debut to, to, to come into against Uriah Hall. Um, Uriah Hall's one of those guys that when we watched him on the um, the Ultimate Fighter, um, everyone was like, wow, this this guy's going to be world champion. He's he's um, he, he's going to go all the way to the top. When he got that um, spinning hook kick against uh, Adam uh, Seller, then we were all like, oh my God, well, th- this guy's going to be unreal. But it hasn't quite played out the way that a lot of people thought he would with um with your R Hall and I mean he's he, he's lost four out of his last five now but when you look at the kind of guys he's fighting um Paolo Costa obviously in his last fight uh the fight before that he he, he defeated Christoph Jotko uh and then he's Gay Guard Musasi, Derek Brunson and Robert Whitaker. I mean they're tough fights, very tough fights. He's fighting the top guys in the division. So um this is this is a tough fight for for Bevan Lewis to come in and make his uh, his UFC debut. Uh, from what I've seen of him, I'm I've been really impressed. Um, he's obviously competed twice on Dana White's Contender Series. He got the win uh, back in t- uh, 2017, the, the initial season uh, against uh, Elias Urbina, and then most recently in in, uh, in July this year, he defeated uh, Alton Cunningham, and and that was a real. Um, I know he trains at Jackson Wink with uh, with the likes of John Jones, and it was a real. John Jones' esque performance, getting in those, uh, getting in the clinch, and he he held that clinch. Cunningham couldn't get out of there, no matter what he tried, and he was pounding away with elbows, knees, uppercuts, and um, every time that the fight broke, it would pretty much the same thing would happen. They'd uh, they close the distance, and uh, and Bevan Luce would um, would step back in again and and, and lock on the clinch and, uh, and 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 continue to work, and he he looked really good. He looked very dangerous. Uh, and, and eventually he put him away quite early in the uh, in the first round. Now, 
this uh, for me, this all depends on which Ural Hall we're going to see. Um, the Ural Hall that fought against uh, Costa, I was, I was actually very impressed with. He, he, he looked very good and um, he, he looked like he was causing Costa some troubles. Eventually, Costa did come through and uh, connected with some of those heavy bombs and uh, that started to wear on your R Hall and uh, eventually put him away in the second round. But it was a much better performance um, from your R Hall than we've seen over his uh, his previous uh, three losses against Masasi, Brunson and, and Whitaker. Um, and, and I'm going to go with your R Hall in this one. I'm going to go with the... Um, the more experienced guy. I just think that he's been fighting at a, a higher level for uh, a long time. Like I said to you, the, the guys that he's defeat, uh, he, he, he's lost to have been real top level guys. Bevan Lewis, I think, can be a, a top guy. I think he, he's got the potential. He's only 27 years old. He's, he has got the potential to um, to go a long way. But at the moment, I think Uriah Hall will just edge this one. I think his experience will... will will come through. I think if he uh, fights like he did in that first round against Costa and, and the way he did against uh, Jocko, um, he, he looked much better and uh, he looked a lot better mentally as well uh, in those two fights than we've seen um, than we've seen previously. Obviously, the key to victory is avoiding that clinch if he can uh, maintain distance, uh, throw those kicks, um, and, and, and yeah, and just uh, and just keep working away on uh, on Bevan Lewis. I, I think your Hall is going to come away with the victory. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, just touching upon what you said in regards to it all depends on what Uriah Hall we get in this fight. To an extent, I agree with that. And I agree with the points that you made in uh, in regards to the Boracina fight because, or the Eraser, should I say. Um, because he, he looked, he actually looked really good in that fight. And when I watched yeah. Tate back, I forgot how good he looked. And before that fight, I'm not sure. I can't remember what the lines were, but I'm sure um, Paolo Costa was sort of like minus 300, minus 400. Um, you know, he was a huge favourite in this fight to to beat Hall. People thought he was going to smoke him in round one. And actually, yeah. <clears throat> Hall had him hurt in, in, in well, a, a, on a couple of occasions in that fight. So he performed well. But in regards to you saying it depends which Hall shows up, how I mean, you go back and look at his losses. So we'll go all the way back into his pro record. You've got Chris Weidman, Costas Philippou. Uh, Philippou, obviously, a bit sketchy, but it was a majority decision, and Philippou did have a stint in the UFC. Kelvin yeah. Gastelum, John Howard, Rafael Natal, Robert Whittaker, Derek Brunson, Gegard Mousasi, who we also beat, by the way. You know, yeah, many people course, yeah. can say that they've beaten Gegard Mousasi. And then, obviously, the, the loss to Paolo Costa. But how can you... Let's go back to the last four. It's going to be tough to look good against someone like Paolo Costa. It's tough to look good against someone like Gegard Mousasi. Derek Brunson, you know, you could argue now you can look good against him, but back then he was knocking everybody out. He was also, yeah. in and around that time, he was also the favourite to be uh, Robert Whittaker in a fight, which, you know, we all know what Robert Whittaker's about now. Yeah. And then even Robert Whittaker himself, you know, he, that was the loss before the Derek Brunson fight, so it's it's going to be tough to look good against that dude. Like you said, the guys fought the best of the best in the division, and um, this is you know you could argue this is a step down for him from yeah from his previous competition. But having said that, Bevan Lewis, uh, he looks like a good fight. He looks like a good prospect. Like you've already mentioned, the key points uh, of victory for Bevan Lewis is the clinch, to get in the clinch, um, to stay in the clinch, to land elbows and knees. The problem is, though, with Uriah fight, fighting that way against someone like Uriah Hall, is Uriah Hall's explosive at short range. So when you're coming in, he'll he'll throw a spin-back elbow or he'll just a straight elbow himself. You know, he's, yeah. got, he's got power and explosiveness in that short range. So Bevan Lewis has got to be really careful when closing the distance to get the fight where he needs to be. Now, um, I just I think Bevan Lewis is a good fighter. I think he's a prospect. I think he's one that is one hundred percent going to be improving drastically from fight to fight. He's a six and zero pro, only twenty seven years old at Jackson Wink. He is only going to get better, and like I say, it'll be these jumps, uh, the, these drastic jumps and improvements that we'll see. However, right now in this fight, I just think he's a little bit too green. I think. He's going to learn from this fight. I think it's a great fight for him to come uh, to come into the UFC. And a little like Montel Jackson in his last fight with uh, 
with Ricky Simone. I think coming into that tough UFC fight, you can learn so much from it. Um, Mike Rodriguez was another one coming in against Devin Clark. Yeah. And he, he said afterwards, thank you to Devin Clark. I've learned this, I've learned X, I've learned Y, I've learned Z. Came in there and smoked Adam Milstead, looked like a totally different <laughs> fighter. And this is what we're going to see from, from these type of guys. But in this spot, in this moment, in this fight, I think Uriah Hall's going to do enough. Um, it wouldn't shock me to see Uriah Hall actually put this dude out, but I do think it's going to go to the scorecards. I do think Uriah Hall is going to take at least two rounds. So I've got Uriah Hall winning. I've got him winning via decision. Now in the next fight of the night, and this is a really fun one. I think it's going to be a barn burner. I think it's uh, it's not being spoken about enough. We've got Andre Ewell versus Nathaniel Wood. So John, who have you got in this one? Yeah, you've. Um... You've just uh, set it up perfectly. It's it, it's going to be a great fight. This is um, obviously Nathaniel Wood was origi- originally meant to take on uh, uh, Tom Dukenois, which would have been a great fight. Um, Battle of Europe that would have been uh, a really fun fight as well. But the UFC have done a fantastic job in uh, in replacing him with uh, Andre Yule. Um, yeah, this is this again is an, another tough fight to pick. I mean, uh, Yule came in, made his UFC debut. Um, against Helen Barrow over in Brazil, um, getting the decision victory. So, I mean, uh, I know we, we sometimes talk on here about um, a little bit of home advantage and things like that, but to, to go there and, and win a split decision... They tried uh, to beat, rob him as well, by the way. Well, they yeah, they did, yeah. Really they, they tried their best, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, he, he, he dominated to that extent that they couldn't even... Um, couldn't even give it to the, the hometown guy. But, uh, but, yeah, I was very impressed with him in... Um, in his UFC debut against Barra, I mean, it's not the Barra we uh, have years gone by. It's it's 2018 Henan Barra, which uh, which is um, f- very sadly he's he's far from what he used to be, but he's still a tough guy and he's um, he's still a former champion. He's been around the block, so to come in on your UFC debut um, in, in enemy territory and, and and perform the way he did, uh, fantastic, and. It sets up a, a great fight against uh, against the prospect um, who himself uh, took on uh, took on Johnny Eduardo and and had to co- overcome some adversity in the first round. Um, he, he he got beaten up, but he, he he's all heart. Nathaniel Wood he he's tough to put away, and uh, he eventually got that dash joke in the uh, in the second round. Um, what's quite interesting about guys who've followed uh, Nathaniel Wood's career probably over the last uh, two or three fights, um, he's in the Johnny Eduardo fight, which was uh, crazy, which was back and forth war, uh, and then that fight in um, in Cage Warriors, uh, Cage Warriors 86 against Josh Reed, where uh, he, he he pretty much came back from the dead to uh, to defeat Josh Reed. He was almost out on his feet, um, but it's, it's quite interesting. Cause I interviewed um, Nathaniel Wood. Uh, Back at uh, Cage Warriors, um, I think it was '97. I, inter- uh, I interviewed him or '96, and um, and he's saying a lot of people think that he's just this brawler that gets involved in uh, wild like tit for tat, you hit me, I'll hit you kind of uh, brawls. But apart from um, from the fight with Josh Reed and the, the Eduardo fight, he, the majority of fight, his fights aren't like that. And um, and yeah. He, he, if he needs to bite down his gun for shield and, and get involved in a brawl, he, he said that he's more than happy to, but he, he never intends the fights to, to go that way. And uh, a lot of his fights in his career haven't. Um, but I do think this will be one of those fights where, where it does end up being a brawl and uh, a real back and forth. Um, for, for Nathaniel Wood to get the win, he's, he, he's got to get on the inside because uh, Yule's got quite a, a a large um, height advantage over him. I think he's got about five or six inches uh, height-wise on him, and uh, it's the same with uh, with his reach. So he's going to be able to um, to keep on the outside if needs be, and, and pump the jab and, and those kicks. Um, so Wood's going to have to get on the inside. Um, but Nathaniel Wood's dangerous everywhere. He's he, he's got heavy hands that we we've seen previously, and and he's got a very good submission game as well. I mean, he trains with some absolute beasts down at Team Titan in London. Um, head coach Brad Pickett. They've got some some really good guys down there that um, that are doing some great things, especially on the European scene. And he's got a very good ground game, Nathaniel Wood, that a lot of people uh, a lot of people sleep on. He's got good wrestling. He can take the fight to the mat if needs be. Um, 
and and as we've seen uh, several times, and, and we saw in that last fight when he locked on the dash joke, he can uh, he can he can pull a submission uh, submission win out of uh, out of nowhere as well. So um, I think Nathaniel Woods going to win this fight. I think it's going to be back and forth. Um, but I think Wood's going to make it scrappy. Like I said, I think it's going to be a war. I think Wood will be able to um, clinch, take him down. Um, even if he doesn't hold him down, I think that'll uh, obviously um, mark a few points on the, the judges' scorecards. Um, as long as he can get on the inside and, and do damage um, do damage there and, and, and not keep this fight at, uh, at range, I, I think he'll be able to do enough to get the win in this one. <clears throat> yeah, and... I'm just going to come out and say it straight away. I think this is actually a better fight than the Duke and Warren Wood um, original schedule. Yeah, I and think you could I was really hyped and really excited for that fight as well with uh, with Duke and Warren Wood. I just feel that with that fight, sort of halfway through the first round, Wood would start to take over massively and it'd become very yeah. one-sided. So I was, very, uh, I was really heavily leaning Wood in that fight pre-tape. Um, obviously, I didn't tape it because... The fight ends up getting uh, getting scrapped, but for this fight, I'm going the opposite way. I think uh, I think Andre Yule's going to cause Wood a lot of problems. So I think it's also going to be one of these crazy fights. The reason being is Wood ha- is going to have to get inside range. Like you've already mentioned, yeah. Andre Yule's going to have a good height and a good reach advantage over Wood. So for Wood to have any sort of success in this fight, he's got to get in range. He's got he's got to be able to hit hit Yule, and to do that, he has to close this. Uh, close the distance so um both though they, they'll, they'll more than happily throw down andre yule can box he's got a good one too uh if again it's the straight shots rather than uh the hooks yeah. or the looping overhands so it's the straight shots straight down the pipe um i think that's where uh nathaniel wood may have some issues in this fight though and i'm pretty sure that's how johnny eduardo dropped him as well in that fight now i don't think there's going to be a finish because i think both guys are genuinely tough for a start andre yule's never been knocked out he has been submitted twice but i can't see this fight being a grappling battle i'd be very surprised if it was um so i don't think wood's going to be able to knock him out and same applies to wood you know i know wood's been finished once via strikes but He's tough. He's a tough motherfucker. And even Eduardo gave him pretty much everything that he could give him. And Wood took it all and still came back. Yeah. The Josh Reed fight, again, you've already mentioned, is a great fight. For anybody that's not watched that fight, just log on to Fight Pass and go and watch it because it's a <laughs> seriously, seriously fun fight to watch. Um, Two minutes long and absolutely crazy. Absolutely, yeah. And it just goes to show the, uh, the durability and... Uh, of Nathaniel Wood and how he comes back from adversity as well. So, like I said, I'd be very surprised if there was a finish in this fight. I just think both guys are really tough. They're both young and hungry. And the reason why they're going to clash and the reason why I don't think Duke, the Duke and Moir and Wood fight was going to clash so much is because I could see Duke and Moir backing off when times got a bit hard um, and he was getting pressurised a little bit too much. Whereas Andre Yule and Wood, when one of them presses the other one and times get a bit too hard, they'll, like you've already mentioned, they'll both bite down on the mouthpiece and they'll both say, you know what, let's have it then. And they'll both <laughs> go, they'll both go at it. None of them will back down. Um, I think it'll be wise for Yule to use angles well and to, uh, to step back out of range at times, though, just because he's got that reach. But when he's sort of inside boxing range, he, he manages to get a lot of torque on these straight punches straight down the middle. I could see a scenario where... Uh, he drops Wood uh, two or three times over the course of three rounds. And we all know in a fight, regardless of how dominant one fighter may be or may not be, a knockdown scores so highly on the judges' scorecards. Yeah. If you knock somebody down in a round, the other dude has literally got to have done something remarkable in that round to, to get that round score to them. So I think if Wood gets dropped at least once over two rounds, I, I just see it, Andre Yule scoring the decision, and I think that's where it's going to go. So I've got Andre Yule to win, and I've got him to win via decision. Now, in the next fight of the night, we've got the returning, the veteran, the legend, <laughs> BJ Penn versus Ryan Hall. Now, if it was up to me, I would not be breaking this fight down, but people want to hear it. It is what it is. You'll get my opinion. John, who have you got? Yeah, I'm with you, man. I, I hate this. I hate this fight. I hate that this fight's going ahead. Um, I hate that BJ Penn is... Uh, still at the age of 40, fighting. He he hasn't won a fight since 2010 when he defeated Matt Hughes. 
Um, and then prior to that, he, he lost his last two. I mean, I think he's won one of like his last 10 fights or something ridiculous. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't even think this will be a particularly entertaining fight at all because Ron Hall is, um, uh, grappling wise, he's an absolute genius. He's, he's a fantastic grappler. Uh, he's extremely dangerous. I've seen him in some, um, some jiu-jitsu competitions and things like that. And he's, uh, he's very good. He's got a very good leg lock game and, um, and yeah, he's, he's a very dangerous guy on the, on the ground. But, um, but from what we've seen so far in his, uh, his UFC career, I mean, he's only fought twice. He, he hasn't fought since 2016. Um, when he was, uh, he won a, uh, very underwhelming fight with, against Gray Maynard. And then obviously won the ultimate, uh, fighter finale against Artem Lobov, where, uh, Lobov just, practically wore him as a uh, as a rucksack for uh, for three rounds and, uh, and not much else happened but uh, I think this fight is going to play out the same way as the um, the, the Gray Maynard fights I think uh, Ryan Hall will just uh, especially early on he won't want to get involved in any silly exchanges because we everyone knows that BJ Penn gasses and especially the further on in his career he goes I, I can't imagine that gas tank getting any better um, so as long as he can stay away from um, what power BJ Penn has left um, for the first two or three minutes, uh, probably the first round he will do. He'll, he'll use that front kick that he used against Gray Maynard and, um, and and just keep his distance, just flick that jab out. Um, but then as the fight wears on, I think uh, he'll, he'll start connecting on BJ Penn and, 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 and beating him up, blooding him up. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he got a takedown and uh, took the back and, and, uh, whether he gets the finish, I don't know, or whether we just uh, we just see him um, ride it out like he did against Lobov. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I, as much as I want to see BJ Penn, like you say, he's a legend. He um, he he's one of the guys that I was uh, watched when I first started getting involved in the sport, and he, I mean he was massive at the time. And and, and just to see, obviously, that he's he's still fighting now, so many years later, and he hasn't got a win on his record for so long. I, I just can't see him. Uh, breaking that that streak here as much as I'd like to see it. Um, I did see something the other day. I, I hope this wasn't true. I, I, I don't think I've seen confirmation that he might have signed a new four fight deal or something like that uh, with I the UFC. That, yeah. um, I hope that isn't true because I really want him to just hang up the gloves and uh, just cement what what legacy he, he has remaining. So I mean, anybody who's new to the sport will just see his record over the last eight years and think, wow, what what the hell is this guy doing fighting still in the UFC? But yeah, I just can't see a way that BJ Penn wins this, unfortunately. So, uh, so I'm going with Ryan Hall in this one. I think it'll, um, it'll either get a late stoppage, third round stoppage, or, or, or it'll pick up a comfortable decision. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet because I don't really want to go into this fight too much. BJ Penn shouldn't be fighting for a start. He should have hung the gloves up after after the silver fight, at least. Um, I think the Yaya Rodriguez fight was just ridiculous to take um at this point bj penn really doesn't have uh have a lot left in the tank ryan hall on the other hand the guy is a good uh, submission artist he's a good grappler that i will give him however the shit that he pulled against gray maynard was fucking disgusting <laughs> um so like i've just mentioned with uh, nathaniel wood and josh reed to go and log on to fight pass and go and watch that fight do not Go on to fight pass and watch <laughs> Ryan Hall and Gray Maynard. The shit that the stunt that he pulled in that fight was, I, I can't even. There's not enough words for me to express how disgusting that was. Uh, at this level of the sport in the UFC, you know, for anybody that hasn't watched the fight, um, I'll make you not go and watch it by just <laughs> briefly explaining what happened. So he would come at... Ryan Hall came out there, he would throw a couple of high kicks at Grey Maynard, back Grey Maynard off a bit. Obviously, we know what Grey Maynard's about. He's a boxer, he gets in range, he likes to look for the takedown. Um, Ryan Hall would have obviously accepted that takedown. Grey Maynard obviously knew that that was a danger, so it was a short, needed to be in, boxing range. So Ryan Hall was just throwing you know, a couple of kicks that were pretty meaningless, and then just flopping and dropping onto his back, Wanted Grey Maynard to come in. Grey Maynard kept on calling him up. And I can't tell you how many times that happened in the fight. It was, like I said, it, it was you could see in Grey Maynard's, in his eyes, in his um, body language, 
as soon as the referee was calling out the decision, he was just like, what the fuck? You know, I trained to fight, <laughs> I came to fight, and I didn't get a fight, and now I've lost a fight. It's like, it, honestly, I, that's all I want to really say about it. I think it's. I think Ryan Hall will want to submit BJ Penn just for the fact of BJ Penn's uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu credentials um, yeah. and how... Uh, how experienced he is in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I think Ryan Hall may want to just uh, have that sort of notch in regards to, yep, yeah, I've submitted BJ Penn. So I think Ryan Hall gets it done via submission, and that's all I really want to see on the fight. Now, moving on to better things, we've got in the next fight Douglas Silva Diandraj versus the Russian Petter Jan. John, who have you got here? Uh, yeah, this is a uh, another fight that could be. Um... In the same category as the uh, Yule against Nathaniel Wood fight. I mean, um, yeah, the, the, this could be fireworks as well. Petter Jan, uh, we've seen him twice so far in the UFC, coming over from ACB, where he was, um, where he, he was fantastic there. Um, and he obviously, he defeated Ishihara first round. He looked really good in that fight. And then he's... Um, his last fight against uh, Jin So Son, that was an absolute war. I mean, he... Although he, he he took a lot of shots, he he landed a lot of shots on uh, on Son and uh, Jinso Son just kept smiling. He literally every time he got caught with a massive shot, you'd think that that one's got to have hurt him, but he was just literally just smiling, staring back at him, smiling. And uh, yeah, that was a, an out and out war as well. That was a fantastic fight, and I think this uh, this this could be another great fight. But this for me is a real step up in uh, in competition for for Petr Jan, and this will really tell us where he stands. Um, in in the division um, and and whether he can hang out with the the real top guys at bantamweight, uh, Douglas Andrade has, has only got a couple of uh, couple of defeats on his record against um, Zabera Tugov um, and uh, and Rob Font. Obviously, uh, Font was at the fight before last where he, he got caught in that guillotine, um, but then he he made amends to that against Marlon Vera with um, w- with a very nice performance. He was. Uh, Pushing the pace, putting on the pressure, and um, yeah, he, he's got a very nice, uh, very nice kicks, um, uh, Andraj, and he worked that uh, that switch quick nicely to the body and to the uh, and to the legs, and and Jan will have to be careful of that. But um, I think Petr Jan will, will have the output to to tire uh, Andraj as long as he he doesn't get backed up and and he does the um, the, the forward pressing. Um, we know he has high output. Um, and and I think Yam will will outwork him. I think he'll he'll be able to um to, to push him back and and put uh, Andrade on on the back foot and um and Yam can go three hard rounds. We've seen that before. Um and I think he's I think he's going to get another win in this fight. I think I do think it'll go the uh, the distance. I, I can't see either of them um being finished. So uh, yeah, I definitely think this fight will will go the distance. But I think um I think Petr Yam just just purely for uh, from his output and, um, and and mixing it up and throwing uh, th- throwing more shots and, and landing more shots on uh, on Andrade, I, th- I think he'll he'll take this on uh, on the decision. Yeah, and I just want to kick this off with Jin Su Son. That dude is an absolute boy. <laughs> like I cannot, I can't wait to see him fight next. You know, the dude is exciting. He's fun. <laughs> he smiles when he gets smacked in the face. You know, what's not to love. However, moving on to this fight, I agree with you. I think Douglas Silva de Andrade is a massive step up for, for Petr Jan. You know, I think Petr Jan's best opponent to date, and the, he's a dude that he's fought twice, is Magomed Magomedov. Um, <laughs> but Magomed Magomedov is a, just a completely different style of fighter to, to Douglas Andrade. And... Um, when you look at Douglas Andrade, like you've already mentioned, the two losses to Rob Font and to Zabera Tukugov, those are two real, like I'm going to say really good losses, but losses against really good opponents. Yeah. However, when you look at the wins that Douglas Andrade has got, there's not many names that really, really stand out to be yeah. elite fighters, you know. No disrespect, Cody Gibson, Enrique Briones, Marlon Vera, they're all good, they're all good fighters in in the time, you know. They're in the UFC, they're at the, this high level, so you have to pay them that sort of respect. But they're not elite fighters, and I think Petr Jan would beat all those dudes as well. So I, yeah, as much as I think this is a step up for Petr Jan, I do think it's a good stylistic fight for Petr Jan. You know, people will argue that. Um, 
Douglas Andrade looked great in his last fight against Marlon Vera over in Brazil, which he did. He looked absolutely fantastic. But we've got to remember that he got a USADA exemption in that fight. So <laughs> take that information how you want. But the dude looked like an absolute machine in there. He was getting peppered with some hard shots from Marlon Vera as well. He just walked straight through every single one of them. He sort of slowed down at one point in the fight. But then like 10 seconds after, this second wind came out of nowhere. So like yeah. I say, I think the USADA exemption may have played a part. I don't like to throw accusations about, but listen, when you've got that sort of information and one dude looks like a com- like a complete machine that he's never looked like in his previous UFC fights, you know, you're sort of putting two and two together and getting four. Um, so I do think that we see a worse version of Douglas Andrade in this fight, and I do think Pete Anne's going to finish him. I think if uh, Douglas Andrade starts eating the same sort of shots as Jinsu's son, uh, was facing and getting hit by. I think Pete Anne's going to have a lot of success in this fight. I do think uh, it will only be a matter of time before uh, Douglas Andrade does end up getting put down or ends up turtling up and the referee having to save him. I think it's going to be that sort of scenario. I think the volume will be there for Yan. So if he doesn't knock him out, I think he can win a decision as well. I think if it comes down to um, the wrestling, I think Pete Anne's probably got the better wrestling. I just think he's got advantages in, in every area here. I think uh, it's a fight that's going to be fun. I think it'll start off uh, quite fast, quite high paced, quite exciting, action packed. But then I think we'll slowly see Petty Ann just step it up a little bit and step it up a little bit and just start to take over the fight. And like I say, although I think Yang can win a decision, that's um, a route to victory for him for or a method of victory. I do think that um, he's going to end up finishing uh, Douglas D'Andrage. So. Yeah, I've got Pete Ann to defeat Douglas Silva de Andrade via TKO. Now, in the next fight of the night, and this is a real interesting one, um, a lot of people are, are heavy on one side. We've got Kat Zingano versus Megan Anderson. So, who have you got in this one, John? Yeah, this is a um, this is a really interesting fight because it's um, a fight that I think pretty much everyone knows uh, what each fighter brings to the table and, and how each fighter wants his fight to play out. Anderson will primarily want to to keep this standing um i think that's where she's she's best we saw in a, a ufc debut against uh, holly Holm. holly Holm, not really notoriously known for her takedowns and, and really strong wrestling and, and top control and things like that but she um she she took anderson down she uh she didn't want to get involved in the, the stand-up she saw a weakness and uh, and she capitalized on it Katsingano, we know he's a very strong wrestler and, and probably her weakness is um, setting up those takedowns with the strikes. So it's a, it's a real battle of uh, contrasting styles, this one. And um, it, I was really glad to see Zingano. Uh, we, we spoke quite a bit against uh, about Katsingano when she um, she fought uh, Marion Renault in her, her last fight. And uh, it was great to see her get back in the, in the wing column. I think she may have very well uh, may have called it a day if she'd have, if she'd have lost that fight um, but I think that win will have given her a new lease of life and uh, I think she'll she'll really want to kick on from there and I think she'll now have um, have, have title aspirations and, and, and be looking towards a, a, a title shot again in the future um, and this is this is a, a very good test for uh, against uh, against Anderson um, like I say we we don't really know she because she's she's fought a lot of, uh, well, all of the fights apart from her last fight outside of the UFC and Invicta, so obviously the standard of competition isn't uh, as good as as she'll be fighting now, and, and Kat Singano, someone who's been around and uh, has fought the best of the best in the, um, the the women's division, so for me, I think Kat is going to get the win again, I think she's going to make it um, back-to-back wins, I, I just think her wrestling is going to be too strong, unless Anderson has done something really dramatic in her takedown defense and she can really uh really keep this fight standing which i i don't think she'll have done enough she may have made improvements she may stuff one or two takedowns but um zingano's relentless looking for those takedowns she'll uh she doesn't mind getting hit uh coming in to 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 uh, get the body lock for a body lock trip and um and and yeah as, as long as she um doesn't take too many shots um, on the way in to, to, to get those takedowns. I, th- I think uh, Zingano's tough enough to um, 
to to, to to walk through them and 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 get the um and get the takedowns and and hold Anderson there because uh, her top game is a lot better than Holly Holmes top game is and and Holly Holmes managed to um to to to, to keep it on the mat and um and and to be honest Anderson looked pretty lost when the fight went down to the uh down to the canvas so uh, yeah I just don't think she'll have had enough time to to really improve on that enough to be able to avoid Zingano's takedowns first and foremost and then secondly when she does get taken down I don't think she'll be able to um get back to her feet uh, so yeah I'm going with uh with Alpha Cat Zingano in this one I think it'll go the distance and uh yeah I think I think Zingano will get the decision yeah, and uh, everyone seems to be agreeing with you, man, and so do I, actually. I, I think Cats is going to win as well. But I do have major concerns in this fight. So let's go back to Megan Anderson and the fight with Holly Holm. So I think, again, similar to what I mentioned earlier with Max Griffin and Curtis Melendo, I just think people were genuinely surprised that Holly Holm went for a wrestling game plan. Yeah. Now, I actually think that was plan B. I think first and foremost, by the way, even though Holly Holm is predominantly a striker, a boxing champion, a kickboxing champion, um, at Jackson Wink, she's going to be improving at all areas of a game, even even at the, her current age. She's still going to be improving. She's still going to be rolling on the mat, using her, uh, sorry, training her wrestling, and just be becoming an all-round fighter. And actually, that pays dividends because she had to become that in that Megan Anderson fight. Yeah, Megan Anderson turned her into a wrestler. You know, Holly Holm came out there. She uh, very early on in you know got a group, got into a groove, got flowing, started doing what she does inside the cage. But Megan Anderson started lighting her up on the feet. She she was getting to the punches first. She was getting combinations going. Her pressure was there. Her aggression was there. And Holly Holm, I think at that point, and I bet Holly Holm that fight as well, by the way. And at that point, for me, I thought, holy shit. Like Holly Holm doesn't have as big of a uh, of an advantage on on the feet as what I thought she had. I watched tape on Megan Anderson before that Holly Holm fight, and no disrespect to her, but she looked quite sloppy. I spoke on the podcast uh, at that point. I think it was UFC two two five. Um, I spoke on the podcast about the holes. I went into into detail about what I saw and how Holly Holm could expose it and how she was the perfect fighter to do that. But Megan Anderson came in, and it was one of those fights where. Um, a fighter comes in and looks so different compared to what they look, looked when I taped. Another yeah. example of that was uh, Loriano Staropoli against uh, Hector Aldana. You know, yeah. that was the same scenario. You tape a fighter, you get a feel of how they are, how they look, how they perform, and then bang, they come in a completely different fighter. And that's what it looked like with Megan Anderson. Megan Anderson turned Holly Holm into a wrestler. And I just don't think that Megan Anderson expected the takedowns to happen. I don't think uh, she'd train much for, for that area of, of the fight. You know, you can argue that if I'm right and she didn't train that much, then that's her own undoing for the fact that she wasn't prepared for anything. Um, I'm not saying that is the case. I just, I can't imagine when you when you're coming up uh, to fight Holly Holm that you you're really training on your your takedown defense and your wrestling defense and your get up game because Holly Holm doesn't bring or doesn't normally bring those tools to to the party now the big thing in this fight is Megan Anderson's going to be huge compared to Captain Garno and what I've just explained in regards to Megan Anderson making those huge jumps of uh, striking improvement, so much so that she turned a great striker into a wrestler, I think that there's going to be no secrets with Kat Zingano in this fight. I think she's yeah. uh, she's going to know exactly what she's been, uh, what she's going to do inside the cage, what she's done her entire career. Kat Zingano is going to want a close distance, especially with uh, the height and reach advantage. She's going to want to get inside. She's Kat Zing- she's going to know that Kat Zingano has watched the Holly Holm fight and Kat Zingano will just probably be looking at that fight, licking her, licking her chops, thinking, you know, <laughs> I've, uh, I know exactly what I need to do to beat Megan Anderson. So where do you think Megan Anderson's going to have been... Um, been working the most on in this fight she's going to be working the most on the the takedown defense the wrestling defense the get-up game she's going to have been training all those things a striking already improved leaps and bounds against holly Holmes. so that striking is it good enough to beat kat zingano striking definitely kat zingano was having problems with uh, marion renault with uh, at points in the fight where she was getting tagged on and I just think if you put Megan Anderson in that spot she's going to absolutely light her up if, if Kat Zingano can't get the fight to the mat I do think though that even though there's going to be a huge size advantage for Megan Anderson a strength advantage I, I think that 
she can't stop them all. I think at some point in 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 at least two rounds, if Kat Zingano gets her down just once, then she'll do enough topside in the topside grappling to win that round. And if that round happens yeah. to be the first round, that first round will go to Zingano. If she does it again in the second round, then that second round again will go to Singano. Then at, almost at that point, you think Megan Anderson, you've got to be thinking she might be mentally depleted or she might just be like, oh, here we go again. And, you know, then that third round isn't going to look pretty. So I do, I'll, I'll always favour the wrestler in these positions. Um, and that's ultimately the reason why I'm going going for Kat Zingano. But man, I don't think this is the clear cut fight that. Um, that that is being set up to be. So I think if Megan Anderson does have a lot of moments on the feet, she'll absolutely light Kat Zingano up. Um, I just don't think she's going to have enough of those moments. And I think that if Zingano does start taking a few hard shots, she'll she'll start to bull rush and uh, just try and really overwork inside to get hold of Megan Anderson. And I think she will be successful via doing that. So I have got Kat Zingano to win and I've got her to win via decision. Now, in the next fight of the night, we've got the heavyweights. We've got Andrei Arlovsky versus Walt Harris. So, John, who have you got in this one? Yeah, this is, um, this again for me is a, a tough one to pick because every time I pick Arlovsky, he loses. And every time I think, oh, yeah, he's done, he uh, he turns around and wins. So, um, so basically, for, for anyone out there who's listening, um, who if I pick Arlovsky <laughs> to win, go the other way. Um but yeah, I, I, I do think Arlovsky, um, the former champion, he's, he's going to get back into the win column here, you know. I, 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 I think his last two fights, he's, he's shown that he um, his, his chin isn't completely obliterated. I know that he's only won uh, two of his his last like, nine fights. Uh, I think it is altogether, but... Um, but yeah, I, th- I think he, especially the two of Vassa fight, I think he, he proved that he's, his chin hasn't completely gone. I know um, we, we spoke about this before his, uh, his last fight against uh, Abdur Rakimov, that, um, that some people are arguing that Arlovsky actually won the, that two of Vassa fight. I think um, he probably, uh, two of Vassa probably edged it. The decision was probably correct, but uh, it was definitely a, a closer fight than everybody thought it would be. Um Walt Harris, on the other hand, um, he's <sighs> he also shares a loss um, with uh, Arlovsky against uh, Abdurakimov um, back in 2016. Um, I, th- I think the, the level of competition that Harris has beat so far, Daniel Spitz in his last fight, I mean, um, Spitz was very elusive in that fight and I think Harris, up until he... he clocked him with that um that big left hand that that wobbled him up against the fence and he eventually flurried for the finish in the second round i, I think he's um he only landed uh i think the commentator said he's unofficially something along the lines of 22 percent to 23 percent of his uh his strikes i mean um Spitz was very elusive in that fight so that's something arlovsky has to be he has to work behind that jab he has to um keep moving he, he can't stay stationary he can't just um be linear when he's um when he's backing out he he has to cut angles um because otherwise we, we know uh, what Harris does possess power in his hands. Um, he's also a good wrestler, Walt Harris. Um, so uh, he, again, he'll have to be be wary of the takedown. Arlovsky's um, got a decent takedown defense, so uh, I, I think he'll be okay in in that um, in that circumstance. But I, I kind of see this playing out to the um, the, the the junior Albini fight. I think um, I think. A lot of people were expecting Arlovsky to lose in that one. I, I certainly picked Arlovsky to lose in that one. But um, but I think he's going to play out similarly to that one. I think Arlovsky's just going to um, going to stick and move. I think he's going to fire out the jab and, and, and keep moving and um, and, uh, and keep uh, cutting angles. And um, and yeah, I think he um, as long as he can avoid that um, that big left hand of um, of what Harris. I, I, I think he'll be able to to outpoint him on the feet and um, and come away with the with the victory in this fight. And uh, I genuinely think he he will get the win. I think he will get back in the um, the win column. His last two fights have been close. I mean that Abdur uh, I think was one all going into the last round, but um, uh, Arlovski just didn't really come out swinging in that last round, and he um, he just looked a bit too tentative. But uh, 
but yeah, I, thought, I, I honestly think uh, Arlovski's going to get back in the the win column here. I think um, I think I think it'll be another decision. Uh, I, I don't think he he's got the power to put away um, Walt Harris. Um, but yeah, I, I'm going with Andre Arlovski in this one uh, to to win by decision. Yeah, I'm going the other way. Um, what is interesting though is there's actually only four years difference between these two, which is just crazy. That, to think that is crazy. <laughs> um, but. I ultimately think that it's either going to be one of those scenarios, and this isn't a cop-out or sitting on the fence because I am picking Walt Harris to win, but it is one of these scenarios where it's either going to be a knockout for Harris or an Arlovsky decision. Yeah. Um, although, actually, I wouldn't be totally surprised if, if Arlovsky did end up knocking out Harris. Harris was hurt really badly against Cyril Asker, which we know by now that's not... a a real good thing to you know for people to be saying yeah. about yeah no disrespect <laughs> to Cyril Asker but he's he's not on that he's not on that level that top level that what Arlovsky's on um the thing from Arlovsky's point of view as well what what's good about him and this fight is he has been at American top team he has been training side by side with uh, Junior Dos Santos uh, obviously helping das, Dos Santos prepare for Tai Tuivasa which was perfect because yep. Dos Santos yep. had a previous opponent in in Arlovsky and now obviously um, the roles will, will have been reversed and it'll be Junior Dos Santos helping uh, Arlovsky fight for the Walt Harris fight so you can sort of uh, make an assumption that with Arlovsky being with Junior Dos Santos, they're both in a similar situation where they were both knocking people out everywhere and then suddenly the chins de- both of the chins depleted and now they're having to turn themselves into point fighters. Junior yeah. Dos Santos, I know he finished tighter with Asa, but nowadays he is more of a, a of a point fighter. So yeah. you've got and he's an ex he, he did that excellently as well. He made that transition perfectly. So you've you've got to imagine that those skills he can Trans, uh, transfer over to another fighter someone like Arlovsky is perfect for him to do that so yeah, Arlovsky might come in here and he might have uh, he might have the game plan to try and outpoint Walt Harris in regards to physical size um, I think Walt Harris is going to be thicker but in terms of actual height and reach there's not too much in it so um, there is a possibility that Arlovsky can just move in uh, one two move out angle off and just really frustrate Harris uh, Harris doesn't, in my opinion, have the best technical striking. Arlovsky is definitely the better technical striker. But the bottom line is, Walt Harris has got 11 wins, and all of those wins have come by knockout. The dude has serious power, whether that be first round, second round, or third round. He's going to be dangerous at any single point in this fight. And I just don't believe that um, Arlovsky can go... 15 minutes with Walt Harris without getting hit a couple of times hard. But unfortunately, although I spoke about this fraudulent glass chin for Arlovsky that he made (laughs) everyone believe that he had this bad chin when actually he doesn't, he is still heavyweight, he is still human, and Walt Harris still has 11 knockouts with 11 wins. So, you know, he's got a 100% knockout rate when it comes to his uh, his wins inside a cage. I just feel that within 15 minutes, Walt Harris will hit him once or twice really hard, and I think that'll just be enough to, to send Arlovsky down to the canvas. So I've got Andre Arlovsky... Sorry, I've got Walt Harris winning this fight, and I've got him winning via knockout. Now, in the next fight of the night, the first fight on the main card... We've got Chad Mendes versus Alexander Volkanovsky. Now, what a fight this is. Great matchmaking. Yeah. It's going to be fun, explosive, fast, action-packed. John, who have you got? Yeah, this is a uh, this is a fantastic fight. I mean, it's kind of um, new school against old school. I know Volkanovsky's uh, 30 years old and, um, and Mendes is only three years older, but it feels like Mendes has been around for absolutely ages. Um, obviously, Chad Mendes, former title challenger, um, Lost twice against um, against Jose Aldo. Uh, the second fight of which, back in 2014, was uh, was a very good fight, much closer than um, obviously the first fight that ended uh, by that knee at the end of the uh, the first round. But yeah, we we spoke about Chad Mendes um, when he came back from his uh, USADA suspension. Obviously, he was suspended. Um, uh, he, he, he fought against Frankie Edgar in uh, in December 2015, and and then obviously he got his suspension, and um, and then he, he next fought against Miles Jury in July of this year. Such a long layoff. Um, we spoke before that Jury fight as to what kind of Chad Mendes would we see? Uh, would he still have that explosiveness? Would he still have his power? Um, 
I know he vehemently denied ever taking uh, any performance enhancing drugs. <coughs> he, um, I think he stated it was uh, some kind of um, uh, contamination in, in, in some kind of cream that he used for, for eczema or something like that. I, I'm pretty sure was his, his reasoning at the time. But um, when someone gets popped by USADA, then it questions their whole career and, and, and have they been um, taking performance enhancing drugs uh, throughout the whole of it. So we had all these questions before the, the Mars jury fight and then uh, <laughs> boy did Chad Mendes answer them in style. I mean, he, he took a couple of minutes to um, to, to, to feel out Mars jury and to to just get away those octagon jitters of uh, returning from such a long time out. But then he... He landed a huge, uh, huge shot that put Jury down, and then he uh, he landed the ground and pound until the uh, the ref was uh, was peeling him off. And um, he looks superb. I mean, it's one of the best Chad Mendes performances we've seen in a long time because Miles Jury is no slouch as well. He's um he's a tough guy. He's a guy that's been around. He's a skillful guy. So <clears throat> it's that that was a fantastic way to return and to really say, look. Um, I'm back. Uh, there's, you don't have to worry about me because I'm, um, I, I've still got that power. I've still got that explosiveness. I can still put people away. Um, Volkanovski's been um, just been mauling people. Um, Shane Young, Jeremy Kennedy, uh, most recently Darren Elkins, who we know is tough as hell, but um, he, he, he takes people down. He, he hurts them. He, he lands heavy ground and pound. He's, he's a very dangerous, explosive guy as well. Uh, will the wrestling cancel each other out? Will Volkanovski be able to take Mendes down? Um, I don't think so, because Mendes is a, a, a fantastic wrestler. Um, he's been um, his wrestling's been uh, one of his his mainstays of his um, uh, his approach to, to to mixed martial arts NCAA throughout his career. D1, man. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I know how you feel about those guys. Um, and then as his career progressed, Mendes. Uh, his striking came along and he started developing this huge knockout power as well. Um, and, and for me, Volkanovski to win this fight would have to take Mendes down, and I don't think he'll be able to do that. I think Mendes uh, will. I think Mendes will be able to take Volkanovski down. I think Mendes will be able to do damage on the feet. So um, for that reason, I, I'm going with Chad Mendes for the win in this one, and um, and to to break Volkanovski's streak of. Uh, I think it's it, it's about 15 successive victories. Um, but yeah, I'm going with uh, Chad Money Mendes for this one. Yeah, I mean, just first off the bat, um, I, Alexander Volkanovsky is is portrayed as um, this young, hungry prospect that's uh, that's coming up the ranks in the UFC. And I'm not saying the dude isn't a hungry, but he's not a young prospect. For a start, <laughs> in regards to his his fight years, he's had 19 pro fights, so that's not young. And he's only th- he's only three years younger than Chad Mendes, you know. Yeah. He's thirty years old, so he's he's not this young prospect that that people think that he is. Um, and even myself, you know, I I'll put myself in that category until you really start delving into this sort of stuff. Yeah. I definitely. just I thought he was a lot younger than than what he was, and I don't think that's going to make much of a difference in this fight. By the way, I just thought um, it was just a relevant point to bring up. Now, in regards to to the matchup. Like we've already mentioned, Chad Mendes, NCAA Division One wrestler, um, Alexander Volkanovsky obviously doesn't have those sort of credentials, and we all know that um, it's a different ball game when you get into these. You know, you can be a good takedown artist or you can be a good wrestler, but the second that you step in against um, an NCAA wrestler from America, it's 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 totally different, man. They're a, they're, a, they're just a set of different yeah. animals. Um, now. Volkanovski, in regards to his wrestling, is it's explosive. Um, he tends to not uh, hit the blast doubles in the middle of the cage or a single in the middle of the cage. It's more of pushing his opponent back, working in the clinch to lock the hands underneath the legs of uh, of the opponents, and then dragging them down the mat that way, or you know, a trip or some form of takedown from the cage. So it's never something that's just. Um, a reactive, explosive takedown in the middle of the cage. Uh, I don't think that he's going to be able to do that to Chad Mendes. I don't think Mendes will allow himself to be backed up against the cage. And as soon as, if if that did happen, the second that I feel Mendes would uh, 
either feel his back against the cage or just know that it's going to happen, I think he'll just angle off and just not put himself in that position. You know, yeah. the dude's a veteran. He's fought the best of the best. He knows he knows all the little tricks and all the escapes inside the cage to be able to not put himself into that sort of position. Now, on the flip side, so with Chad Mendes and his wrestling, uh, I think he could take Volkanovski down, but... I just feel that this fight is going to predominantly take place on the feet because I feel that regardless of wrestling credentials and regardless of uh, how many times each fight has taken another fighter down or how many times they've been taken down themselves, I just think if any of them, if, if Chad Mendes or Volkanovski take each other down, I think the other will just pop straight back up. I, I, don't yeah. think, uh, I don't think any of them will have that sort of level of control topside enough to keep them keep their opponent down for like a minute or two minutes. I just, I, I really don't see that happening. I think their opponent, like I mentioned, will just get straight back up, which like I say, leaves it predominantly in the striking battle, which makes it really fun because Volkanovski um, likes to come forward. He loves to come forward. He tends to always have that effect on fighters to push him back. Now, although I think Mendez is explosive and he's a great striker and he holds a lot of power, I do th- I, I do think that he will be the one stepping backwards more than stepping forward. So I do think predominantly the fight is going to take place on the feet. I think predominantly it's going to be Alexander Volkanovsky uh, doing most of the pressing. But... Volkanovski's got a few holes in his striking, so although he's got power, of course he's got power. The dude's knocked 10 opponents out out of 18 at this weight. So mm. um, I do think that he could hurt Mendes on the feet. That's, uh, that's a legitimate scenario. But the two types of strike, in my opinion, what I've seen in tape with how he comes forward, how he evades strikes, how he moves backwards, and the head movement or lack of in this case... He's very vulnerable, in my opinion, to uh, lead left hooks, and he's very vulnerable to overhand rights and uh, and and right hooks as well. Now, when you look at Chad Mendes, those are his weapons. He's got a mean lead left hook. He's got a good right hook. He's got a good overhand right. In his Chad Mendes is more explosive. So, although he'll be on the back foot a little bit more. He'll come forward in that blitz and he'll throw one of those strikes. And mm. those are the st- those are the type of strikes that connect on Volkanovski. And I just feel that when again when when you're analysing uh, analysing the striking battle, which I think like I've already mentioned multiple times now, that's where I think it's predominantly going to be. I think you've got to look for those holes and who's going to be more successful with with the striking. So although I feel Alexander Volkanovsky will have more volume in this fight, I think the explosiveness of Mendes and the type of strikes that he throws um, is the type of strikes that uh, Volkanovsky is defensively vulnerable towards. I, ju- I just think that um, they can both have success, but I do see Chad Mendes landing one of those big bombs and... Um, I'm telling you, it does not matter how good of a chin somebody has. Chad Mendes has knocked out so many fighters that have never yeah. been knocked out before. Jory, one that we mentioned in his last fight, yeah. never been knocked out before. Comes in against Chad Mendes, who's had X amount of years off due to being popped by USADA and gets knocked out in round one. <laughs> you know, the, the, it doesn't matter how good your chin is. Chad Mendes possesses that sort of power. So I think it's going to be a fun fight for as long as it lasts. Um, I do think we're going to see some crazy exchanges, but I see Chad Mendes getting the better out of those exchanges. I think he finds one on the button, and I've got Chad Mendes to defeat Alexander Volkanovsky via knockout. Now, in the next fight of the night, we've got Ilya Latifi against Corey Anderson. So, John, who have you got in this one? Yeah, this is a um, this is this is a real fun fight in the uh, the light heavyweight division. With um, I mean, this could have uh, real title implications as well. Uh, Elie Latifi, the sledgehammer. I'm a I'm a real big fan of his. Um, he's a the guy's an absolute tank. He's a he's a beast. I mean, he's um, probably at the moment the fighting um, and competing the 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 best he, he has done so far in his his career. I mean, that win over uh, over in St. Prue, the standing guillotine in his last fight, and then um, Tyson Pedro. Everyone was real hot on Tyson Pedro at the time, and um, and, uh, and Latifi shut that up quickly. Obviously, he did lose his fight before that against Ryan Bader with that um, that huge jumping knee uh, that completely put him out cold. But um, but yeah, then you're looking back to, to 
four fights ago in, in, in 2014 against uh, Jan Blachowicz, um the last time he lost prior to that. So I mean, he's only lost one of his last six fights against Ryan Bader. And Ryan Bader is a um, a real top guy. He's a real top light heavyweight. I was very surprised when the UFC let him go. I know they didn't particularly like his style, but um, <laughs> he was kind of a uh, a bigger version of Chad Mendes. Is how I saw Bader. He, he, he was a strong wrestler. Very dangerous wrestler who uh, who developed um, knockout power as well and and and, and dangerous hands. But <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, I think Corey Anderson's going to have his work cut out here because um, predominantly his game is his wrestling. We saw that again in his last fight against Glover Teixeira. Teixeira's not the Teixeira of a few years ago, but he's still a very dangerous guy. And and Anderson um, was just better than him. He, he took him down and, um, and 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 just outworked him and and. To share or just um he just couldn't get into the fight prior to that um anderson beat patrick cummings um but when you look through anderson's wins i know that uh mma masters doesn't work we say this all the time but uh he, he does hold a, a win over uh jan Blahovic, but besides that tom lawler fabio maldonado uh sean o'connell patrick cummings um <clears throat> they're not top guys when you you come up against the uh, the real top guys, Ovin Sempru, Jimmy Manua, um, Shogun Hua, or that fight was a, a robbery. He uh, lost that. Uh, Gian Valente, who um, Latifi holds a, a victory over only four fights ago as well. Um, yeah, I just think Latifi's better uh, better standing, better striking. Um, I think he, he, he's a good, very good wrestler as well, so I don't think Anderson's going to have a very easy time taking him down he may be able to take him down but i think latifi will be able to get back to his feet when he does go for the takedowns he has to be careful of that guillotine and um especially when he's uh clinched up against the cage as well has to watch out for that standing guillotine and um and anderson has he's prone to um to the big uh, knockout shots as well. The Ovid Semperu head kick we saw, that brutal Jimmy Manawa hook that we saw, um, the Gian Vellante uh, knockout. And Latifi's got some hands of stone as well, and he can put people to sleep. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going with uh, I'm going with Latifi in this uh, in this fight. I think he'll um, I think he'll finish Corey Anderson. Um, I think he'll finish in the second round. Latifi has been known to gas um, the, as the fight wears on. Uh, that has improved slightly over the last few fights. Um, but yeah, but I think second round. I think um, I think Latifi will, will, will land a big shot on Corey Anderson that will wobble him, and then I think Latifi will just um, land a flurry of strikes and and put him um, put him away and, and, and get the victory. Yeah, I think Latifi's got two rounds to do this. Um, yeah, I think it, it's going to be really awkward for Corey Anderson because um, he's a six foot three dude, uh, NCAA Division three. So, again, great wrestling credentials and he'll pretty much be able to take anybody down in that division. You know, we saw what he did to Pat Cummins, an NCAA Division One wrestler. So, yeah. um, the problem he's got in this fight, though, is Corey Anderson is he doesn't look for uh, the trips or the throws. Obviously, you know, with his wrestling background, it's the singles, it's the doubles, it's chaining those together and ultimately looking to pick his opponent up and dump him on the mat. But with Aaliyah Latifi being five foot eight, so <laughs> a significant height, what we think is a disadvantage for Latifi. I actually think it, it works better in his favour because yeah. Anderson's not going to be able to uh, drop down and level change that low, that easily, to be able to get in on Latifi's hips. And if he does, Latifi's got every opportunity at that point to land an uppercut, a knee, or just something brutal as Corey Anderson's head's that low. It's Yeah it's almost going to be awkward for Corey Anderson to take him down. So I actually don't think Anderson does get him down in this fight, regardless of uh, the wrestling credentials. I just think the the height disadvantage is actually an advantage for, for Latifi, yeah. which then the fight takes place on the feet. So I think Corey Anderson's the better technical striker. I think he's got the better boxing. Now, the problem that Anderson's got is regardless of how good he is, or how much better I think he is on the feet, he's got serious chin issues. Yeah. Um, Latifi hits hard as fuck. We know that by now. <laughs> we know what he's done to, you know, so many opponents in the past, hurting him so badly. Just, he, he's like, he's got iron 
bricks in his hands. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like all he'll have to do in this fight is just hit Anderson clean once, in my yeah. opinion. And Anderson will either wobble, he'll drop, or he'll go out cold. And I just think that because the fight's going to be taking place on the feet, in my opinion, I think it does, because like I've already mentioned, I don't think Anderson gets him down. I think that just leaves so many opportunities for Latifi to land that one shot. And I, like I say, I think he's got two rounds to do it. Like you've already mentioned, Latifi has gassed previously in fights. Listen, if Anderson comes out here and he boxes smart and he moves in and out of range smart and he uses his reach smart and he just he just has a, a good performance from um, a fight IQ perspective and just landing volume on Latifi, it'll frustrate Latifi and Latifi will get to a point where he's rushing getting inside. He's trying to overwork. He's working too hard just trying to to get his game going. And mm. then I feel towards the end of the second round and into the third round, it'll just be really easy for Anderson because at that point, I do think Latifi will have tired, slowed down, will be looking a little more laboured, whereas Anderson has got really good cardio, so he'll go three rounds all day, no problem. I am picking Latifi to win this fight, though. And the reason being, I, I just think he lands that one punch within that time limit that I think he's got. Um, I think he could almost risk... If, if Anderson is struggling to take him down, I think Latifi could almost risk taking a one, two, or th- even three-shot combination to get inside to land that one shot, knowing yeah. that Anderson might not knock him out. Um, so, yeah, I've, I'm going Latifi to win this fight. I think it's quite an awkward fight, and it's one of the harder fights, in my opinion, to predict on this card. I think the line's off, by the way. I think I think it should be closer to a pick in this fight. But, like I say, awkward fight. I do think uh, both fighters have got solid paths to victories. I'm just going with Ilya Latifi to win, and I'm going to take him to win via knockout. Now, in the next fight of the night, we've got Carlos Condit versus the upcoming welterweight fighter Michael Chiesa making his welterweight debut in this fight so John who have you got in this one uh yeah I think um I think it's a good decision by um by uh, Michael Chiesa to to step up and um in in weight class and go to welterweight because he's a big guy he's um he's six foot one and he's um he's not a skinny six foot one either uh like myself he uh he, he I think he'll fill out nicely in this division I, I think it's the right decision he's really um really depleting himself to to get down to lightweight. So stepping up in weight, I think, um, is a really good decision. I think, um, I don't think he'll have any major um, size disadvantage issues uh, against Carlos Condi either. Um, but yeah, I, uh, for me, I, I'm going to go with Kessa uh, to win this fight. Um, Carlos Condit is... Someone that I know is on a four-fight losing streak. He he's only won uh, like twice himself since 2012 over the course of about 10 fights. Um, for me, he's not there mentally. Uh, he's he's talked about retirement and flirted with the idea of retiring several times over the last few years. And he's come back and had a fight, and he just looks um, he just doesn't look like the the same Carlos Condit of old. I think that loss to Robbie Lawler at UFC 195, that um, that split decision loss for the for the title. I think that just that was his final, um, his real final chance at, at winning the belt. And uh, I think when he lost that fight, um, we've seen him in another really close uh, title fight against uh, Johnny Hendricks as well. Um, no, was it Johnny Hendricks or I can't remember who it was, but uh, I, mean, I know he fought uh, George St Pierre and then. Um, then he fought Johnny Hendricks afterwards. Yeah, it wasn't for the bell, but um, but yeah, I, th- I think that that loss to Robbie Lawler um, just really took the wind out of his sails. And, and from there on in, he's been teasing the idea of retiring, and then coming back and fighting. And I just don't think he's there mentally. I just don't think he's the same dangerous, natural born killer that we um, we used to see. The one who um, defeated Thiago Elvis so viciously. The one who. Um, Breeze through Martin Campman, who defeated Nick Diaz, um, who <laughs> sent uh, Dong Hyun Kim to another dimension. He's just not the same guy anymore. Um, he gets taken down too easily, um, although he does get back to his feet a lot of the time. Um, we've seen that less and less over the, uh, his recent fights, and he, he's been struggling to get up as much. Um, <coughs> excuse me, um, Michael Chiesa, um, he's known for taking people down. I think he's 
tagging out pretty much all of his opponents bar Kevin Lee, who's a very good wrestler. Um, I know people are saying, oh, he, he, uh, Kessa got uh, beaten up on the feet against uh, Anthony Pettis, but Pettis did damage against uh, Tony Ferguson. And, um, and Pettis looked really good in uh, in his last two fights, actually, and against uh, Kiesa and against Tony Ferguson. He, he, he's looked really good and he's looked like the Pettis of old. So I don't think we can read so much into that. And the fact that um, Kiesa came in overweight in his last fight against uh, Pettis. So he's obviously he was completely uh, depleted in that fight. So I don't really think that's a good, uh, a good measuring stick for, for how this fight's going to play out. But... I see it playing out like every Carlos Condit fight, to be honest. He, he'll get taken down. Um, he may get back to his feet. Um, but like I say, he's, he seems to be struggling more and more to get back to his feet now. Um, when he does get back to his feet, I don't think his kicks and his punches have the same pop and uh, the same power that they used to. Um, so I think Kessler will, will not be as worried about those um, about those shots as maybe uh, these two would have fought five years ago or something like that, or, or maybe even three years ago. Um, so I think Kessel will, will be happy to close the distance and, and work for the takedown, and he'll get the takedowns because Condit's um, kryptonite has been his uh, takedown defence throughout the majority of his career. So, yeah, I think uh, Kessel will win this fight. It wouldn't surprise me if he... Uh, gets a submission because he's, he's dangerous on the on the ground as well. It wouldn't surprise me if he got a submission uh, late on. Um, if not, he's he's going to get the decision win. Yeah, this is my free play of the night. So I've got four units on Michael Kiesa and I got it at minus one six two. I just think it's a really good fight for Kiesa. It's a really good spot for him. Carlos Condit is you know he's not old in in regards to age, but in regards to his fight game and his fight years, he's got a lot of mileage on the clock. Condit's thirty four years old. He's got forty two professional fights. Um, he's on a four-fight losing streak. He's won once in five years. And I just think with Chiesa moving up, it's the right move for him. Um, welterweight is is more of his natural weight. I've spoke to people that have seen Chiesa and saying that he looks really big. So he's definitely not going to, from what I've heard and from what I imagined anyway, he's, he's not going to have uh, uh, any sort of size, real size disadvantage against Carlos Condit. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the thing is for Condit is... Every single one of his losses, bar Robbie Lawler, uh, have got a common theme to it, and you've touched upon it already, and it's his, uh, it's his takedown defence. Yeah. Every single fight that he's lost, as far as at least the UFC and WEC go, apart from Lawler, he's been taken down. So you look at uh, Alex Oliveira, took him down three times. Magni took him down six times. Maya took him down once. Woodley took him down three times. Johnny Hendricks took him down seven, uh, 12 times. GSP took him down seven times. Martin Campman took him down five times. Miura took him down three times. Carlo Prata took him down once. Brock Larson took him down once. John Alessio took him down four times. Jake Shields took him down five times. So this is the common theme with yeah. uh, with Carlos Condit. You just get in all of his losses... Again, aside from Robbie Lawler, he gets taken down. And again, as you've already mentioned, Kiesa, apart from the Kevin Lee fight, has got a takedown in every single one of his fights. So you've got a guy that's not just in his decline struggled on, on takedown defense, but throughout his entire career, that's how you've beaten the guy. And then you've got a guy in Kiesa who's a, a grappler by by trade. You know, that's where he does all his best work. He's got great submissions. He's a good topside grappler. Um, he's a good defensive grappler as well. And you saw in the Pettis fight, he went straight for the takedowns. You know, yeah. he had a tough cut. He missed weight. Uh, I think he sensed that he didn't have 15 minutes in his gas tank in that specific scenario. So what did he do? He went to try and take the fight down straight away and tried to get Pettis out of there early. So the gas tank didn't come into play. I just think that in I'm not sure where where Carlos Condit is right now. I'm not sure what uh, he's got left to to offer for the sport. He's a veteran. He's a legend. Um, he's he's done some fantastic things. He's given us some great fights. His nickname is the Natural Born Killer. The dude's a finisher. The dude finishes fights. Fifteen knockouts, thirteen submissions. But the point is, in this fight, he hasn't had a, a knockout win in five years. He hasn't submitted anybody in ten years. Then you go and look to uh, his record on the scorecards. The dude's two and six. So, like I've said, then you start adding up uh, the four-fight losing streak, the one win in five years. 
everything's just just doesn't sit right with me and, and Carlos Condit. And this is why I think Chiesa is a, a great spot for this fight. You know, I've listened to interviews in regards to how he's feeling with uh, the move up to welterweight. It was his own decision, which I think is important. We've yeah. seen how successful fighters have been recently. And I know I, I harp on about this, but the middleweight title fight is between two ex-welterweights. So that just... You know, you just got to look at recent moves from fighters that have moved up on their own decision and on their own accord to how well and successful they're doing. Uh, Kiesa was talking about how he used to get this uh, this cloud of fog sort of surrounding his his mindset and his vision of inside the cage. And even up to two weeks after the fight, it still would only just start clearing then. But this time, there's no cloud of fog there. He can just concentrate on fighting. He's seeing things better. He's sharper. Um, and he's just... He's just enjoying the sport again. He said he yeah. uh, he, he stopped enjoying um, the training and uh, not so much the fighting, but every, you know most of the stuff going on within MMA. But now he's moved back to to train at his home gym, which is Sick Jitsu. It's not a camp that I've been overly impressed with. If I'm if I'm being honest, throughout the years, but you know a, a happy fighter is going to be a fighter that performs. So mentally. Kies is there. Then he's gone over to the Performance Institute. From what I've been told, you, you get tied in with 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu and, and a couple of other camps as well. But yeah, I, I just think everything surrounding Michael Kiesa in this fight is really great. He's going to be the one that's going to look more improved. He's going to look better. We're not going to see a better Condit anymore uh, as time goes on. I just think, like I say, Kies is in a really good spot. I think he's going to be able to get uh, takedowns in this fight. I think his striking is going to look better if he is sharper and if he, if he is seeing things a little bit better. I think his striking will be a little bit better. Whether that's enough to compete and beat Condit if it's a complete striking battle, I'm not sure. I still think Condit would win in that scenario. But yeah. if these rounds are close and it does go to a decision... Um, I think the, the close rounds will get scored depending on little things that happen. So uh, if Gazer gets a takedown in, in two of the three rounds, then it's those little things that will get scored on the judges' scorecards if the round's close. But ultimately, I just... I think even though Kiesa can win a decision, and he's probably probably more likely to if it goes that far due to, you know, previous uh, previous fights and records of fights going the distance, I do think Kiesa finds a submission along the way. So, like I said, I've got four units on Michael Kiesa, and I got that at minus 162. Now, in the co-main event of the evening, we've got Chris Cyborg versus Amanda Nunes, a fight that we've all been screaming for for so long, and we finally <laughs> get it. Who have you got in this one, John? Uh, yeah, first and foremost, um, I hope this fight goes ahead because uh, I think most people who have got social media will have seen the, the video that's been going around of uh, of Cyborg this week. A um, bit of horseplay and a shopping trolley and, um, and there was rumours that she broke her ankle or rolled her ankle and uh, watching the video, it doesn't look particularly uh, pleasant for her, so I'm... I'm, I'm fingers crossed we, we do get to see this fight because uh, because like you say we've we've all been clamoring for this fight for for um, for a long time. Um, secondly, if the fight does go ahead, does is there an injury there? Will does she have? Uh, will that ankle be, uh, be be weakened? Did she take any any damage from from that fall? We don't know. Again, it's. Um, there's all a bit of uh, uh, an air of mystery around it. I know that Cyborg did um, uh, the tweet or put out on her Instagram um, very shortly after the uh, the video was released. Uh, just a, a, a single caption of uh, several sad faces to which everyone started speculating that the fight was off. But there's been um, nothing since. She's confirmed to people on social media that the fight's going ahead. So, yeah, just firstly, I just wanted to get that in. Fingers crossed we, we, we do get to see the fight and... And hopefully there's no, if we do, there's no underlying injury as a result of, uh, of that incident that happened this past week. Um, so on to the fight itself. Um, this is a really good fight. I mean, we all know how how much of a beast Cyborg is. We know how dominant she's been. We all know that she, we struggle to find natural uh, featherweights, that can compete with her because the vast majority of people that are coming up like Amanda Nunes now are bantamweights that are going to be 
uh, stepping up in weight. We saw it with uh, um, Holly Holm, uh, Kunitskaya, um, Leslie Smith. Uh, I mean, the, these ladies have fought um, throughout their career, sometimes at featherweight, but the vast majority of the time they they are moving up in weight. And, and Cyborg just noticeably has that uh, strength and that power advantage and just that natural size. I mean, she cuts quite a lot of weight anyway to get to featherweight. So usually come um, come the time that the uh, the octagon doors is being locked, she's um, she's just huge in, in comparison to, to her opponent. I think Nunes size-wise will be similar to Holly Holm, um, maybe slightly bigger possibly. Uh, than Holly Holm was. Um, again, she'll probably give up, um, give up size uh, to to Cyborg, no doubt. Um, but I, I think she does have the the speed advantage, and I feel really toying with with Amanda Nunes here to to get the shock and, and shock everyone and get the win. I, I think she can go five rounds, and I think she can withstand what Cyborg can throw at her to to go the distance similar to, to Holly Holm. Um, I think when Amanda Nunes lands on Cyborg, um, I think she would do more damage than Holly Holm did with her strikes. Um, but the big question about Cyborg previously was, can she do it over the course of five hard rounds? Because she just destroys everyone so quickly. Um, we never get a chance to see that, but we we kind of saw a little bit of resistance against uh, Tonya Evinger, and then we saw Holly Holm take her the full five uh, five five minutes, and and bar a couple of little flurries from Holly Holm, Cyborg looked pretty confident and comfortable going the distance. Um, so if this fight does go the distance, I, I don't think we have to worry about Cyborg's gas tank or anything like that. Um, ultimately. As much as I wanted to go with Nunes in this fight, I just can't bring myself to do it, and I can't bring myself to to say the words. I think Amanda Nunes will defeat Cyborg. Um, I, as much as I'd be shocked, I wouldn't be massively shocked because I think out of everyone that Cyborg has uh, faced, I think Nunes has the best credentials. She's she's strong. She hits hard herself. She's fast. She's good in the clinch. Um, if needs be, she could take it down. She's, she, she, although she's not really known for that, but um, she's always improving as well. We've um, we we see her improve fight on fight, and uh, that most recent loss against Katzingana, which came in 2014, um, her gas tank was questionable then, but um, since then she's she's gone five hard rounds against uh, Valentina Shevchenko as well. She's so he's, she's improved in that area. But yeah, I just can't bring myself to to pull the trigger and say Amanda Nunes is going to get the shock here. I think this will be the toughest test for Cyborg throughout her career. Um, but if Cyborg's in there, a hundred percent fit. I I just can't go against her. I think it'll go five minutes. Uh, sorry, I think it'll go the full uh, five rounds. Like five, it could go five minutes with uh, with Cyborg's power. But I think it'll go the full five rounds again. Um, but I think Cyborg will will rack up the damage over the course of those five rounds, and and will come away with um with the win in this one. Yeah, I think uh, I think this this fight is both their biggest tests and the yeah their careers, you know. Uh, you can make well. It is a legitimate case that you make when you're saying that this is the best fighter that Cyborgs fought, and uh, I'm hearing a lot of people saying it, and they're absolutely correct. But then um, this is also the best fighter that Amanda Nunes has, Nunes has ever fought as well. Now, yeah. I think Cyborg's going to win this. Um, the thing is with with Cyborg is she's she's going to have a huge. Um, size advantage over Nunes. We've already seen them square up together, and although they're going to weigh in at the same weight, hopefully, um, <laughs> at, at the weigh-ins, when it comes to actually being inside the cage, Cyborg will have filled out. She'll have hydrated uh, properly, and she she will be the bigger fighter. She will. And it's not a case of a towering Nunes. It's the thickness, and she's yeah. going to be a very imposing uh, fighter inside the cage. She's aggressive. She's a bully. So she'll be the one advancing forward. And listen, I'm sure if you speak to Cyborg and, you know, you see a lot of 
uh, well, every opponent always back off from Cyborg because you know somebody has to be the aggressor. But I'm sure if you speak to Cyborg, she would she would love uh, a fighter to not back off and just meet her in the middle because yeah. that's that's her type of fight. She can land a power, she can land a hard knees, get in the clinch. Um, but that just doesn't happen because of, like I said, of how imposing Cyborg is. And I see nothing different in this fight. Now, Amanda Nunes normally likes to be the aggressor, likes to be uh, the bully and be the imposing force inside the cage. But the fact is that unless this fight goes like a minute and a half, one of them one of them has to give, give that up. And I just see that being Amanda Nunes. Now, I don't think Amanda Nunes is anywhere near the same fighter that she is when she's moving forwards. And in fact, so much so that we haven't seen much of Amanda Nunes fighting backwards. Uh, I think yeah. we saw it a little bit against uh, Kat Zingano, just purely for the fact that <clears throat> there was that uh, worry of the takedown. But Amanda Nunes, in my opinion, doesn't fight and won't fight the same moving backwards to, as what she would moving forwards. Now, the Amanda Nunes that moves forwards and Amanda Nunes that's the aggressor and the bully is the reason that Amanda Nunes has got this title shot because she's been taking out all these uh, all the all the up and coming fighters in in the division and it is it has got to a point where there is nobody left and now yeah. it's Cyborg. So, like I say, that's why she's got the title shot. But in this fight, she's going to be the one moving backwards, in my opinion. Now we've. We've seen Cyborg fight against a fighter moving backwards, which is obviously all the fights, but I mean an expert at it in Holly Holm. Now, in my opinion, Holly Holm is probably one of the best, if not the best fighter, um, women's fighter in in mixed martial arts, fighting moving backwards. She's an expert at it. Yeah. Um, she's, like I've already mentioned, she's a boxing, she's an ex-boxing champion, ex-hit-boxing champion, and she's she's spent most of her career on the back foot striking. That's where she flourishes. So when you ask me who's the better fighter moving backwards out of Amanda Nunes and Holly Holm, it's Holly Holm every day of the week. And Cyborg has already beaten that expert in moving backwards. So I don't see, unless Amanda Nunes thinks, no, fuck it, I'm not moving back. I'm <laughs> going to stay I'm gonna stay right in front of you and we're going to trade and we're going to have it out. Or if she tries to take Cyborg down, I just don't see how how Amanda Nunes can can win this fight moving backwards because, you know, you could argue, oh yeah, but she she'll throw little leg kicks and she'll throw little point scoring shots. That's all well and good, but Cyborg will will cut off the angle. She will close the distance and against a fighter that doesn't primarily fight on the back foot, they're not going to be as used to. Um, uh, having an, an opponent cutting off those angles and putting that pressure on. I think this is going to be something relatively new for Amanda Nunes. I also think that the whole cyborg scenario is very similar to what we used to hear when Anderson Silva used to have a fight, George St. Pierre used to have a fight. They yeah. always used to wear the, the pre-fight talks um, next to the cage with Joe Rogan and Mike Goldberg talking about how this is a different test and this fighter brings X and Y and Z to the table and or you know although we've seen GSP and Anderson Silva dominate this is a new challenge for him and this is how they could finally lose this fight you know just really selling the fight based on something new and something different but yet when they got inside the cage GSP and Anderson Silva would just handle their opponents just in a slightly different way that they've handled the rest of their opponents and it's almost I almost feel like it's a similar thing with Cyborg. We're always like, oh, but this is different for Cyborg because, like you've just mentioned, John, can she go Can she go five rounds here? Or how is she going to cope fighting someone that primarily wants to get her to the mat? And how about this? And this fighter brings this talent and this attribute, yet when they get in there, Cyborg just fucking handles them anyway. And I almost <laughs> I almost feel that this is it's one of these scenarios where, and let's be honest, the, these fighters will eventually lose a fight and if yeah. if Cyborg does ever lose a fight in the UFC this is going to be that fight because I don't I think, think so. after this fight Cyborg is going to fight anybody better than Amanda Nunes I just think that stylistically Holly Holm was uh, was a harder fight for for Cyborg because of those um because of the striking credentials moving backwards. And this is a real factor in this fight. Now, if Amanda Nunes can get Cyborg moving backwards, fuck, this is a different scenario. This is a different <laughs> outcome because Amanda Nunes will, I'm, I'm pretty confident, win that fight. But Cyborg, I just don't see moving backwards, man. She's too yeah. big. She's too physical. She's too imposing. Um, 
I don't think she knocks Amanda Nunes out. I think Amanda Nunes is on a bike enough to, to stay in the fight. Um, but yeah, I've got Cyborg winning and I've got a winning via decision. Now, the main event of the evening. We've got John Jones versus Alexander Gustafsson too. Now, John, we normally don't discuss sort of picks and stuff before the podcast. I quite like that as well because, it, you know, it's a bit of a surprise, especially when one of us is leaning quite heavily on one <laughs> way and then the other one goes another. But you have let leak that you're picking Alexander Gustafsson, so I hope that you've got a very good explanation for this. Off you go. Um, I am indeed. This is my uh, my my wild take. Um I will say it here now, I, John Prentice, am, am going against uh, arguably the greatest of all time, John Jones, and I'm picking Alexander Gustafsson to win this fight. Um, I'm just a, a really big fan of Gustafsson. Um, I, I think that first fight was was razor close. Um, I mean, it was a razor thin decision. A lot of people still to this day argue that Alexander Gustafsson won that fight. Um, and I think Gustafsson has the the best style out of anyone that John Jones has faced or, or could face at present to uh, to defeat him at light heavyweight. Um, if we're talking about a better light heavyweight than Gustafsson, I think Daniel Cormier is that. And I know uh, John Jones has, has disposed of uh, Cormier twice, although the, the most recent outing got overturned to a no contest. But specifically to fight against John Jones, I think Gustafsson measures up better. Um, that's be- because of his his height and his reach. I mean, they're both very similar heights. Um, Jones has got such a huge reach. I think it's about an 84 and a half inch reach. I mean, Gustafsson's got a massive reach and he's still uh, about four or five inches shorter. Um, but he, he he's slightly taller than John Jones and, and I think that's what caused Jones so many troubles um, and so many problems in their, their first meeting. I know that uh, John Jones has turned around and said, oh, I was partying and out clubbing and everything in the, the week leading up to the uh, the first Alexander Gustafsson fight. And that may be true. That may be, um, <laughs> he, he may just be complete bullshit to be, uh, to be honest. We, we don't really know. Um, Having failed the um, the USADA test, obviously, then there's a question mark over um, has he been on something his whole career? Um, so obviously that now has to be taken into consideration, and and obviously we don't like to accuse people of anything on this podcast, but he, he failed the test, and 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 if he has been taking something, and now he he's not taking that something, will will we see a completely different John Jones? Um, I know when Jones came back um, from that um, that first layoff and he, he fought against Ovid St. Pru, um, he did not look great at all. I know he'd mixed up his training then and he'd been doing a lot of um, like bodybuilding and he, I think he was too big, to be honest, to fight the way that he likes to fight and that didn't really work out well, but he didn't look very good in that fight at all. Obviously, he came back he, and, and I thought Cormier actually looked good good in and and won um the first couple of rounds um he, he definitely took a round off john jones um arguably won won both the rounds before he got finished in the third and um and yeah in that first fight we saw gustafson take down john jones uh we saw him hurt him on the feet uh when they were standing um he can take people down he, he took DC down. Uh, he has got really good wrestling. He's got really good MMA wrestling. Um, so uh, he's got that up his locker. Um, he's got good kicks. His boxing's really crisp. Um, I, I'll be tempted to say his boxing's better than John Jones' boxing. Jones has got the kicks and he's got the elbows. He's got the clinch work that's better than Gustafsson, but um, I think uh, Gustafsson's boxing is better. Um, I, I do think it's going to once again be a really close five-round war. I think it's going to go the distance. I don't see John Jones stopping uh, Gustafsson. Um, Gustafsson's only been stopped um, 
a couple of times in his career. Once by Phil Davis for a choke when he was very young back in uh, 2010. He's improved massively since then. And then obviously the the Rumble Johnson fight um, in Sweden. Uh, I was there at that fight in, uh, in in Stockholm, and and Johnson just. You know what Johnson's about. If he connects with you, he, he puts you down. He, he did that to Daniel Cormier. He did it to Gustafsson, and uh, he just swarmed. And, and Gustafsson couldn't um, couldn't shake off the the, uh, the onslaught. He couldn't um, he couldn't escape. He couldn't uh, get in a, a positional advantage. And uh, he wasn't put out cold. He he, he was still had his wits about him. He was just uh, taking too many shots, and the ref had to step in. I don't think Jones possesses that. Um, the, f- the finishing power that will stop Gustafsson unless it's very late on um, and Gustafsson's gas tank severely depleted. Uh, he did get hurt, semi-hurt a couple of times in their first fight in the clinch uh, with a couple of those knees, but um, but there wasn't enough to put him away. Um, John Jones' last four fights, of course, um, not including the, the Daniel Cormier fight that uh, was overruled uh, and overturned to a no contest, uh, all went the distance. So, yeah, I think it's going to go to a decision. I think it's going to be really, really, really close again. But I, I, I really do think that uh, Gustafsson's going to squeeze out the, um, the the decision in this one. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a, a split decision if... Uh, the, the, 48 47s uh, alternated across the board and uh, but yeah I'm, I'm going with the Swede I'm going uh, against probably 99% of the MMA community but I'm going with Gus uh, in this one it's interesting that you talk about the split decision because if you think it goes to a split I'm very surprised that you think Gustafsson will win that split um, even if he should or shouldn't win um, I just feel that if it's that close and it gets to a split decision I think the judges are going to be scoring it to to John Jones. Um, I just think the, the the bias will be there in regards to not them thinking, oh, I like John Jones better, but just the fact that John Jones presents um, a lot more uh, attributes that are easily um, easily favoured in the judges' eyes over um, yeah, quite possibly, over what yeah. Brings. So I, I do think that if it goes to a split decision, I'd be very surprised if... Um, if the fight's that close that they actually give it to Gustafsson because we all know who the UFC want to win this fight for a start. <laughs> yeah. um, so I I totally disagree though. I think <laughs> um, I think John Jones is, is going to win this fight and let, let's just forget about everything surrounding the outside, uh, the outside of the sport for a second and just look at the skills and the areas which they both flourish. I do tend to agree with you inside boxing range that Gustafsson may have an edge um, I do think it's still pretty close though however when you look at everything else so you look at uh, kicks um, kicking range movement um, angles wrestling uh, Muay Thai grappling um, bottom side or top side I just think John Jones has the advantage in every area over Gustafsson now a lot of people will talk about and, and rightly so uh, how close their their fight the last fight was the football their first fight and um, it was really close and Gustafsson shocked pretty much everybody with with how close he made that fight because at that point John Jones was tearing through everybody and it yeah. wasn't just everybody that some were good and some were bad it was tearing through the best of the division whilst they're in the prime as well. And this is this is a key factor that I don't think many people mention. The fact that John Jones wasn't beating the big fighters that were sort of off the game a little bit or maybe starting a decline. These were all the best fighters in the best form of the careers and he was taking them out. So I've been almost shocked with this, uh, with how Gustafsson, how close the fight uh, Gustafsson made it. Um, I just think that and I, I said this in a different fight, and I'll go on to that in a minute. I think this was Gustafsson's uh, fight of his career. So another fighter that I said that with was Cody Garbrandt against Dominic Cruz. And after that fight, when Cody Garbrandt was due to fight TJ, I actually bet TJ, and I was in the minority um in that position because everybody yeah. was going to Cody Garbrandt. They were looking at his last fight and how he absolutely schooled Dominic Cruz to a point that not only shocked everybody, but it was just it, it was such a surprise with with how 
dominant Dominic Cruz had been in in that division, and he wasn't yeah. on a decline yet. Cody Garbrandt came in there and just absolutely, like I said, schooled him. I think that's the right adjective to use. And that I said at that point that was Cody Garbrandt's fight of his career. That was his performance of his career that he will be unable to replicate after that. And everyone's like, no, no, you're crazy, you're crazy. That that is Cody Garbrandt. That is how he fights. And and. In my opinion, I think I've proved that case now with, with Cody Garbrandt because I know TJ Dillashaw is a slightly different stylistic matchup to Dominic Cruz. But listen, when you're doing that to Dominic Cruz, if that wasn't the performance of your career, then you would be able to to put in good performances against uh, again well in future fights and in this scenario against TJ Dillashaw. Whereas I think this is the same for Gustafsson. I think the performance of his career the fight of his career was that john jones fight that i just don't think he'll ever be able to replicate again and i feel that that that's the case i mean since that since that loss he went and beat uh jimmy manoa took him two rounds uh, a lot of people um uh, had been questioning Manoa's chin, so maybe t- him taking two rounds to do it was a little bit of a question mark. But he still got him out of there, so props to him for that. Then he got deaded by uh, by Anthony Johnson. A lot of people do, is what it is. Then it, he had a close fight with Daniel Cormier again, albeit uh, a, a decent performance. But the point is with Gustafsson is he's falling short, man. Like... He gets the opportunities. He had an opportunity against John Jones to to win the title. He fell short. He had an opportunity to to climb even further with uh, a win over Anthony Johnson, who was knocking everybody out. That would have been a statement. He fell short and got knocked out. Then he got given the opportunity with Daniel Cormier, that was the next best in that division. So that's an actual step up after being knocked out in round in in round one against Anthony Johnson. And again, he fell short. Then he comes in against uh, Jan Blachowicz. Um, He couldn't strike with, with Jan Blachowicz. Jan Blachowicz was, uh, was working him on the feet. And this is pre-new doctor Jan Blachowicz as well, by the way. <laughs> so then he's having to take Jan Blachowicz down to eke out uh, a, dull, a dull, boring decision just to get the win. Then he goes in there against Glover Teixeira. Yes, he, he he looks good in that fight and he's in control of the fight, but the dude's turning his back and running away. He just almost looked in that fight that he was just scared of getting hit by anything. He, he just looked... He looks more he looks more concerned about losing than he does about winning. And like I say, I know he I know he, he did end up knocking uh, Glover to share out, and he won every single round of that fight. And he did look good, but there's just the little things that I didn't like. Like I've just mentioned the 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 ducking and turning the back and the running away and just not wanting to. I mean, no fighter wants to get hit, but just he, he just looked. I don't know. It was weird. I I can't really put it put it into so many words he just looked really scared of getting hit and I just think with, with Gustafsson he's just the guy that's falling short uh, and it all stems from the John Jones fight which like I say I think is it's the performance of career I mean John Jones like I've mentioned was tearing for everybody if you go that close with John Jones that you could have potentially beaten that guy that nobody thought anybody could beat at that time, then you should be beating Anthony Johnson. You should be beating Daniel Cormier. You shouldn't have to be grinding out Jan Blahovic. You shouldn't have to be running away from Glover Teixeira. This is what I mean. I just think that everything surrounding Alexander Gustafsson right now in regards to him not being able to replicate uh, a performance as good as that John Jones one, I just think he is off. I think uh, there is obviously question marks with with John Jones come coming in. You know what is he going to be like if uh, if if he was take if he was on peds and now he's not. I don't think that they're going to have affected uh, his performance that much. I think they'll have affected it to to a certain degree if he was on them. But let's let's not forget, like you know, you start to cut the uh, cut the band short. Um, you know it. We we don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of questions surrounding that scenario of if he if he was if he wasn't. He said that John Jones said in an interview they they found what was equivalent to a pinch of salt thrown into an Olympic swimming pool. That's how much they found in his system. Does that mean that if that's true, if that fact's true, does that mean that that pinch of salt created that knockout on Daniel Cormier? Yeah. I don't think so. I think that knockout would have come with or without the peds. So. There's so much regarding that, and like I've already mentioned in the Alexander Gustafsson fight, the first fight, um, 
you know, you mentioned that you, he said that he was out partying. Uh, I heard he'd only he'd actually only trained two weeks for that camp. Do I believe that at that time? Absolutely. Remember, this was a John Jones that uh, hit and run on a pregnant lady. <laughs> this was a John Jones that uh, openly admitted that uh, he, he was out there and doing things that he shouldn't. So would I be surprised that he thought uh, Gustafsson would be an easy fight and decided to party and not train as much? Nah, that wouldn't surprise me one little bit. Now he's focused. Now he's ready. I think he's got all the tools to do it. I think he beats Gustafsson in every area of the fight. Um, I don't think Gustafsson looks anything like what he did in that first John Jones fight. And in fact, I actually don't think John Jones looks much um, too much like uh, how how he was in that first fight either. But this is my hot take of of this fight. I actually, and I don't want to be a fun sponge, but I actually <laughs> think this fight is going to be quite dull. And if it is dull and it's a point fight. I also think that favours John Jones all day. I don't think John Jones is going to put him away. I will give Gustafsson the benefit of the doubt in that respect. So I've got John Jones winning this fight via decision. And that is all she wrote for the fight breakdowns, guys. But we move on. Welcome to the hot topics portion. So the first thing that I'd like to kick this off with is surrounding one half of the main event, the returning John Jones. Obviously, I do think we've got to talk about John Jones. Um, <laughs> obviously, a lot of stuff surrounding... Uh, him inside and outside the cage and you know just the excitement of the the dude that people are tipping to be the greatest of all time um finally back in the cage every time i see you know sort of a, a little two second uh two or three second gif or someone mentions john jones that we're going to see him back in the cage i get goosebumps i'm really excited um what's your take on 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 the return of him john and also what do you think about all the antics outside the cage? Do you think he's uh, he's mentally overcome that? Do you think it's going to affect performance? Do you, do you think, you, in your opinion, I mean, we're allowed opinions on, on the podcast, do you think he was on performance hence enhanced drugs? And if so, do you think that um, his performance, this performance against Gustafsson will be affected? Do you think he looks worse because of it? What What's your take, man? Um, yeah, but... I agree with you in the uh, the first respect that John Jones coming back is huge for the UFC. It's huge for mixed martial arts. And it's huge for us fans. I mean, it's um, it's great to have him back. I I love the the, the big uh, the big name guys. I just love the buzz that's around when these guys, John Jones, uh, obviously prior to Anderson Silva. Um, obviously, you've got Conor McGregor nowadays. Uh, before is Ronda Rousey, GSP, people like it's, it's just fantastic, and and there's a certain buzz in the air when people like John Jones. It's a fight week, and John Jones is he, he, he's fighting on the the Saturday evening for us, I mean, or Sunday morning for us, it should be. But um, but yeah, he, he, I'm really glad to have him back because inside of the octagon, he like we we said at the start of the the podcast, he's arguably the greatest of all time. He's he's without doubt the greatest light heavyweight of all time, um, and he's he's in the top three um, for me of, of of the greatest fighters across the the whole board uh, of all time. And he's what he does inside the octagon. He, he you cannot. Um, question you, you there's no doubt that he's an extremely talented guy uh he's got some fantastic finishes puts on fantastic performances and like you say he was steamrolling through everybody for um for a large period of time until he started running into um his troubles outside of 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 the octagon and and that's where he really lets himself down because um <sighs> To to not mince my words, he, he he seems like a bit of a scumbag outside of the uh, of the octagon. Let, let's put it that way. He's um, I think he's been uh, been found doing cocaine previously. Obviously, he's got his USADA ban. Obviously, you mentioned he uh, there was a hit and run on a pregnant woman. Um, there's all sorts of stories. I mean, there's that story going around how true it is that uh, USADA came to test him at the gym and he hid under the um, the octagon that they've got there, he'd under there like for about eight hours to avoid being tested. And I think that was around the time that he was looking absolutely jacked ahead of that um, OSP fight as well. So, um, yeah, his actions outside of the octagon, I mean, when he, him and uh, DC were, were due to fight for the first time and he, um, 
uh, they, had, they had that big fight at the um, the, the press conference, and um, and they were both fined by uh, the Nevada State Athletic Commission. I mean, outside of the octagon, he doesn't paint himself in in any glory whatsoever, does he? Um, but yeah, in, inside of the octagon, he, he, his talents cannot be denied. Um, when we look back at the career of John Jones, when all he said and done, and and he retires. Um, some of his wins may look even more impressive if if the stories turn out to be true that he was partying and only training for two weeks ahead of title fights and things like that. And it could well be true. He, he, he does seem the kind of character that would do stuff like that and, and would approach a fight like that. I mean, um, you you mentioned, do I think he's got over those um, misdemeanors um, and whether he's a, a reformed character? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't. Uh, to be perfectly honest, because he's had one, two, three, four opportunities to um, to to right his wrongs, and to he keeps coming back and saying, "Oh, I'm a, I'm a new, I'm a changed man. I'm I've matured now, and this and that." And then then something else seems to happen, and he's either the most unfortunate man in in mixed martial arts, or he's he's just one of the stupidest. And uh, it could be a case of. He had too much too young. He became the champion, the youngest ever um, champion, I believe, uh, at the age of 23. And maybe it's just a case of too much too soon, all this money, all this fame. And uh, he just went off the rails. But uh, I know there was, I can't remember who it was, somebody else who, who it could be Colby, actually, Colby Covington possibly wrestled yeah, with was. him. I know what you're about to say. Yeah. yeah, and he said that he was uh, he was a scumbag back in those days as well. On um, before he had to drugs. Colby and... Covington says. Don't well, that's very true. Yeah. Salt as well, you know, I love the guy, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, he, um, he's, a, he he's a character in himself. <laughs> he says gospel. Um, yeah. No, so, I, yeah. So yeah. So I, I I don't know. I don't know whether he's turned a corner. Um, was he on performance enhancing drugs? Uh, I can only go by. Uh, what you saw the fan and they they tested him and found him positive for performance enhancing drugs. I know a lot of people um, have their sentences cut short or or, or their punishments t- um, um, rescinded because of tainted supplements or whatnot. But yeah, the the fact of the matter is he served a suspension for a foul disorder um, test. So I I believe. <coughs> And the kind of character he is, what he's done in the past, I, I believe he, yeah, he probably was taking performance enhancing drugs, um, uh, or, or he has done at some point in his career, maybe. Um, and this is the only time he got caught. And, but yeah, um, inside the octagon, he'll go down as as one of the greatest of all time when when all is said and done, without doubt. Yeah, and in in regards in regards to the Peds, like some people say that you know how they question if he would ever have been this great without them and you know did he only win previous fights because he was on performance enhanced drugs so let's just for the sake of argument say that um, he was on them for the majority of his career whether he was or wasn't we don't know but like I say hypothetically for the sake of argument let's say he was now the fighters that he's fought in the UFC I think you would be very very naive to believe that most of those fighters weren't on also on performance enhanced drugs yeah. for example he fought trt Vitor. Vitor, <laughs> yeah you know like the the thing is with usada when usada came in so many people popped initially and are still popping now yeah. with that uh institution in place with the testing in place so before that fuck i would fucking hell i would i would, I would guess that like 90 percent of the <laughs> roster was on them Definitely they've had to do something about it and the majority of them got popped anyway. Yeah. Um, that's just how it was, man. People were on performance enhanced drugs. That's what happened. Yeah. And no the doubt. thing is, John. Jo- the point I'm trying to make is I'm not trying to, right now, I'm not trying to argue for or against USADA. We'll do that in just a minute with the second hot topic. Spoiler alert. But <laughs> John Jones was on a level playing field all of his pretty much all of his career and if any fighters weren't on peds when before, pre-usada then that was their choice it's still a level a level playing field they probably could have been on peds and gotten away with it just like hypothetically john jones and most of the fighters that he's ever fought so i don't think that you can take any sort of uh greatest of all time status away from john jones because 
uh, he was popped with peds and people think that that might have been the case for the majority of, of his career because like I said the chances are most of his opponents were on them as well yeah so first and foremost I don't think you can take that away from John Jones whether he's over the stuff um, you know the personal stuff he was going through and uh, sort of that stage in his life where he, he was a bit of a bad boy, a bit of a rebel, and he was partying and uh, potentially uh, taking drugs at parties, and then the hit and run scenario, which is actually, if you listen to interviews, the one thing that still sticks with him. You know, he says that he can forgive himself for everything else that he's done. You know, he was young, he was, uh, you know, a bit stupid, and just going through that stage that most of us go through in in life you know and then when you add to it like you've already mentioned the fame and the money and um being the youngest ufc champion and you know it it's gonna have adverse effects on you in your life you are gonna start thinking that you're untouchable that nothing bad can happen to you and you can do whatever you want and i totally i totally understand that i totally get that um, but he says that he can bury all that and just put that down to mistakes and things that happened in the past and he can move forward with his life. Um, he does mention, though, like I say, that um, hitting the pregnant lady is the one thing that, that stays with him. He's got a family now himself. He's got children himself. And, you know, he sort, I think he's now starting to, uh, to mature and see things in a different way, you know, putting the shoe on the other foot. It's all those sort of things where I, I do believe that... Um, you know, I, I know you said the uh, the words you use that is a bit of a scumbag outside the cage. I think that he potentially was previously. I do believe that people can change, especially uh, when you know in age and growth and changes to the lives. And like I say, when when you get a family and you're starting to think of things a little bit differently and put yourself in positions where other people have been in against you in the past, I do think you can change. I do think you can grow. Uh, as a person and I think that's exactly what's happening to John Jones I think he is maturing is he on uh, going back to the peds is he on peds right now I've got absolutely no idea <laughs> I would think that it would be catastrophic for this to happen again so I would say no he's not but I can don't I, think... um, can I interject uh, temporarily there's a there's yeah. a breaking news that uh, UFC 232 has been moved from Vegas to Los Angeles because uh, John Jones uh, I'm just reading this off Damon Martin's Twitter um, has an abnormal drug test result for the same substance that triggered a positive test in 2017. Uh, USADA apparently believes it's a trace amount left over from the previous issue last year, but Nevada won't sanction the fight. So this is all over. Brett uh, Okamoto as well is reporting this. So um, <laughs> as we as we speak about John Jones and, and drugs, uh, yeah, it's hot off the press. UFC 232 is moving to LA. Interesting, and especially interesting. at a time when I was literally just about to say, "Is is he on them now?" So yeah, that that that's that's interesting for sure. Um, I'm just trying to have a look myself now. I'm not sure if the the saying that he's definitely off the card or not. Um, uh, I think they're saying that he's still on the card, but um, Nevada won't sanction him. So and uh, the California State Athletic Commission have, but this is <laughs> man, this I, is crazy. I, yeah, I've, I don't think I've ever seen the UFC move an event in like six days notice i know they've um yeah, they've this, moved, is they've nuts, this this is the reason why i've i've chosen john jones for for the hot topic because it, it's like <laughs> i mean it's i was literally just saying I, I, it would be catastrophic for something like this to happen yet again and then <laughs> just about to say is he still on peds who knows and then you know you've intervened with this and <laughs> man i don't know what to make of this we'll obviously find out um We'll find out in in the next sort of few days. I would imagine what what's going to happen. I mean, what's your thoughts? Do you think the fight will still go on? Do you think it'll? Do you think it'll I be pulled? I, I have no idea. I mean, at this point, we don't. You know, we yeah, we've got. Clue, so. <laughs> Daniel Cormier has just tweeted he's tested positive again! Exclamation mark! This is crazy. I, I God, I don't. How um. How perfect timing for the uh, for the hot topic we were talking about, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'll unravel over the next few days. Um, it looks at the the moment. I mean, I'm pretty sure the UFC would be confident that he's not going to get pulled from the fight because I don't think they go to the logistical nightmare of relocating to a. a and also complete, think of the fans yeah. that bought tickets as well. You know, exactly. flights, yeah, hotels. Man, um, there's going to be a lot of angry people. 
if John Jones comes off the card, every, you know, the, there is going to be there's yeah. going to be uproar on it because Definitely. if he's come off the card, then people have chained, you know, booked travel and accommodation and tickets, etc., for for absolutely no reason when they could have just pulled him off the card in. Uh, in Las Vegas, so yeah, interesting right. stuff, man. We'll we'll see how that plays out, and yeah, uh, you know we'll we'll keep our eyes on that for sure. And then that leads me on to the next thing we're going to talk about. Usada, <laughs> Usada's yeah. on the list. So do you do you agree with Usada, John? Do you think it's a good thing? Do you think it's a bad thing? There's a lot. There's actually a lot of mixed reviews on this, and I, I personally I personally don't hate on people that uh, think that Usada is a bad thing. And personally, I'm in. I, I have that opinion as well. I think uh, the UFC would have been better off not getting new side of it. And I know people will be then saying, oh, you know, yeah, but it just uh, advocates uh, cheats and ped users and uh, this, that and the other. But the way I see this man is USADA coming in. Everyone was on a level playing field before anyway. If you wanted to, yeah. to be on performance enhanced drugs, great. If you didn't, that's fine too. But everybody was on that level playing field, just like what I've been speaking about with, with John Jones and, and, and his career, you know, for the fighters that weren't on him or the fighters that were on PEDS, you know, it's it, it's a level playing field. But with USADA coming in, we're getting so many fights cancelled. We're getting uh, good fighters suspended for like two, three years at a time. Then they're coming back. They may never be the same because of the, the layoff and, you know, the publicity that they've had surrounding getting the suspension. Um, the fact that they're always constantly hounding people, you know, Daniel Cormier spoken about previously how they're always testing him um, and he's been clean for an, uh, an absolute career. I just think that, I think that UFC would have been better off from a fan perspective and it would have been I can't really say better off from a fighter perspective because, you know, they were, I think they were on a level playing field before and I still think they're on a level playing field now because, you know, technically nobody's using the, that's inside a cage because they'll have been tested. So I just think it's just become a nuisance to the sport, the fact that the um, a fight gets pulled off and then suddenly, uh, f- from a fan perspective, they may have been going to that event to watch watch that specific fighter they may have been on that fighter's allocated ticket list if it's family and friends they may have already yeah. uh, booked travel and accommodation to see that fighter and then for the opponent as well the opponent may still have to make weight to get show money which yeah. just seems pointless knowing that they're not fighting or they might get a new opponent and it might be a totally different style than than what they've been training for therefore they've paid for a fight camp to to aim specifically for one guy which then now that's really deemed pointless so I just think as a whole, the if it's not broke, don't fix it. And the UFC was fine before USADA came in. And, you know, that that's my opinion anyway. A lot of people will disagree with that. And I totally get that. That's fine. And that's your opinion. I, I also do understand the other side of this as well. For the, fact that, for the fact that people do want a drug-free sport. I just think from a fan perspective, it's it's been more of a nuisance than it has uh, a really great thing. What about you? Yeah, I, I, I kind of see the same uh, across the MMA community that you do. I, I always see one of three responses when it when it comes to USADA. Either people are really for USADA and they think it's great, yeah, we, we shouldn't advocate uh, the use of performance enhancing drugs. We should do everything uh, within their power to, to stop that, etc. Um, and you, uh, you get the second group of people where who just look at USADA and the kind of in agreement that, that there should be something in place to stop performance enhancing drugs in sport, but USADA is just a bit of a mess sometimes. I mean, like you say, you get fights pulled and then um, like guys taking off cards, etc. It transpires a few weeks later that they hadn't failed the test or the it was a um, a contaminated substance and things like that and yeah i mean and some of the things that flag you as positive i know the the list is like absolutely extensive for all the substances that you can't take and um some of the things you, you do find in just everyday common items as well i mean i know there's a lot of um medicines tablets or inhalers things like that that you, you you can get some of these substances in and sometimes I, I do I do believe that some people have been flagged by USADA when they probably haven't done anything wrong and I believe that there are some people that slip through the net and 
and probably are still taking performance enhancing drugs. Um, and then the third group of people are, and I, I, I do see a lot of these people as well. And um, and then the people that kind of just say, let let them juice, let them be. They like to see fights with fighters juice to the gills. I mean, uh, Vito Belfort's one of the prime examples. Um, TRT was, uh, and, and Dan Henderson's an, another guy. Now he was a, a beast even when he was off the TRT and he's tough as hell. But um, as soon as those kind of guys came off TRT, they just, they were noticeably not the same, both physically and, and just the way they performed. I mean, Belfort was an, an absolute monster and then he kind of just went to a bit of a, what you'd typically expect of, of, of somebody his age, um, and, and and didn't look in particularly great shape for someone who's who's always been so in shape. I mean, you could argue that he's always been on steroids all his life, and he possibly had if there was, uh, like you say, if he was a level playing field, and I'm sure um, a lot of people were. I know this talk Johnny Hendricks when Usada came in. Johnny Hendricks was never the same. A lot of people, although uh, GSP was very anti-drugs, I know a lot of people claim that they think GSP was on uh, steroids. Anderson Silver, another one who's been, uh, who's popped previously, was he on steroids all his career? I mean, these questions we'll probably never know the answers to half of them, but um, at least before um, like you say, people had the choice, either yeah, I'll I'll, I'll take steroids. No, I won't take steroids. But now it kind of it just I mean I fall into that that second category where it just seems awfully messy. And, and with Yasada, you always see someone pop and they get pulled from a card, and then a few weeks later the decision's overturned. And and some of the punishments as well seem very school. Like, I I don't know whether it's just the communication uh, between Yasada and the public and maybe the fighters behind closed doors know a, a lot more as to the reasons why, but you'll see one guy pop for something, get six months. You'll see a first time offender. You'll see another first time offender get uh, two years, Chad Mendes, for example. Um, then you'll see um, John Jones. He's popped twice and, and he uh, got two years and, and, and the sentence was reduced. And you'll see someone else who's popped twice. And I can't remember off the top of my head who it was but got four year suspension and you just think like it just seems so obviously I know they probably give different levels of punishment for the amount of a substance in your body what substance it was etc but it just seems from a, a fan perspective on, on the outside and you don't get all of the finer details as to and the justification as to why Fighter X has got this amount of time and Fighter Y has got this amount of time uh, yeah, it just just seems messy, and and I know some guys. I don't know, you know, some guys in the the UFC, and they have to give all their whereabouts to Yasada. I mean, like 365 days a year, they have to let them know and constantly like keep giving them email addresses and, and, and phone numbers. And if they're going away on a holiday or doing anything, they have to let them know everywhere that they go in case they turn up and get uh, get tested. And like you say with Cormier, never once failed a drugs test, but keeps getting like hounded all the time and things like that. And then you see exemptions get thrown in there. And uh, I think there was something with Brock Lesnar um, with regards to an exemption and things like this. And you, it just kind of, when you look at it like that, you just kind of think, is it, is it all worth it? Is it? Was it easier just to go back to how it was? A lot of fans preferred it that way. Um, people banging it out with two, um, two, two muscle heads. And yeah, I mean, I don't think they've brought much to the sport, really. I don't, and I don't really think people want to see their favourite fighters get popped and, and fights pulled from the card. Quite, quite frankly, I know that again, like echoing what you said, that we shouldn't really, ad, we're not really advocating the use of performance enhancing drugs. But how it was before, it was just a level playing field. People chose to take them, and they take them. People chose not to, they wouldn't. But people knew what they were letting themselves in for, so to speak. They, I'm sure fighter A knew that fighter B was taking steroids and he was going to be fighting him. And if he agreed to fight him and he knew he was taking steroids, he agreed to fight him and he knew he was taking steroids. And uh, and that's just how it was. And yeah, I think it's just for me, the um, just obscurity and the, the, the differentiation in punishments and, and circumstances and, and things like that. It just doesn't seem to, just doesn't seem to be 
one rule for one and, and uh, one rule for all. It's all it's mostly to one rule for one, one rule for another. So yeah, it for me it's been a bit of a failed experiment so far. Whether they can iron out some of these issues um, and, and, and sort it out over time, uh, I don't know. But um, yeah, for me, I know uh, I see a lot of fans complaining about USADA and they preferred it how it was five years ago. Awesome. So finally, as always, we'll discuss the potential fights that could earn fight of the night bonus or performance of the night bonuses. So who have you got in this one, John? I think a um, possible fight of the night. I think Douglas Andrade against Petter Yan. I think that could be a really good fight. I think the uh, Andre Yule Nathaniel Wood fight will, could be absolutely amazing, but we speak about this all the time as it's on the fight pass prelims. Will they give that fight? Um, front, uh, one of the fronts of the night I, I don't know and I don't think so um, I also think Chad Mendes against Alexander Volkanovsky could be a very fun fight but uh, for fight of the night I'm going to go with um, Andraj against uh, Petr Jan I think that'll be uh, a really good back and forth I think we could see Latifi knock Anderson out I think that could win a um, the fronts of the night bonus and, and Michael Chiesa as well uh, if if he latches on a submission and, and gets a sub over Carlos Condit, which we both think he he very well could, then uh, I think that'll pick up the, the other performance of the night bonus. Well, for me, I think, uh, and I know I've said this, uh, my hot take is the fight could be dull, and that's now if the fight happens. But <laughs> if the fight isn't dull, that I think the main event will get fight yeah. night naturally. Yeah. You know, I I, th- I think it would only it would only need to even be mediocre at best to probably get that as well. You know, it's a huge fight, um, and you know, th- there's common trends with this sort of stuff we've spoke about on previous podcasts. Performance of the nights, uh, I agree with you with Michael Chiesa. I think if uh, he sinks in a choke, there's only two fighters on the card that I think will get submissions, and that's uh, Chiesa and uh, Ryan Hall. Ryan Hall, yeah. But I think Chiesa will have to look much better than what Ryan Hall will have to look to get the submission. So, um, based on that, I think uh, if Chiesa sinks in uh, a submission and gets Carlos Condit out of there, I think he'll pick up a a performance of the night bonus. Chad Mendes is the other one. I think Chad Mendes is going to knock Volkanovski out. Um, and I, I, it's always Chad Mendes knockouts are always fun to watch. Uh, they're always brutal as well. So yeah, I'm going Chad Mendes to to get a performance of the night. Kesa to get a performance of the night, and the fight of the night to be uh, John Jones and Alexander Gustafsson. And that's the lot for this week's podcast, guys. For the bets at UFC 232, don't forget to check out the premium bets from Newsom MMA and the membership options available too at newsommma.co.uk forward slash premium hyphen bets. So, John, before we hit the Newsom MMA two-minute plug, what do you need to mention, man? Uh, yeah, as always, um, check out Fight Post um, either on Facebook, uh, Twitter, or www.fightpost.co.uk. Um Always some good stuff on there. I haven't been as active recently, um, but, uh, but but there's always some good stuff on there. And uh, I will be having um, a, a piece on with Tom Breeze in the new year. Uh, obviously, uh, he'll be fighting at uh, UFC London, so look out for that. And um, and as always, just hit me up on Twitter at MMA and Me. Uh, always like to to talk with the MMA community about the uh, the sport that we love and get into some back and forth and and, and just chat about some fights. So. If you're down for that, then uh, then hit me up on Twitter. Awesome. So now for the quick Newsom MMA two-minute plug. First of all, I'd like to talk about Concussion Pro One, who are partnering Newsom MMA. Concussion Pro One is the world's first dedicated concussion supplement, supporting brain health and performance. The product is honestly groundbreaking, and there isn't another supplement like it on the market. The unique formula that makes up Concussion Pro One has been developed and created by some of the world's most decorated sports scientists to help protect and support the brain in its performance. Approved by the UK Mixed Martial Arts Federation, Concussion Pro One provides some amazing support to the brain. It increases mental performance, faster recovery from injury, reduced inflammation post-impact, improved neural protection and much more. With professional athletes such as Alexander Rakic, Mark Dikeyzi and Scott Askham using Concussion Pro 1 you can already see how vital the product is not only for MMA but for all combat sports. Find out more information by clicking on any of the banners on the Newsome MMA website or go to concussionpro1.com Secondly, please check out the sponsor of Newsome MMA which is CBD Life UK I'm a great case study for CBD in the MMA gambling world, people often talk about sweats and nerves as they're watching the fight that they've bet on fight these feelings are absolutely real and because of this i vape cbd to 
help relax me on fight night. If I'm honest, I didn't think it would make much of a difference, but it really does, and I'd honestly recommend it to anybody. You can access the offers from my sponsorship by clicking on any of the banners on the Newsome MMA website, and you can get 15% off your first order by using promo code Newsome MMA. And that's it from us, guys. Enjoy the fights on Saturday night and have an amazing new year. Yep, for real. Uh, enjoy new year and uh, enjoy the fights.